7 p.m. Let me call to order the meeting for the Merrimack Planning Board for May 2nd, 2017. Uh, let me remind everyone <clears throat> who addresses the board tonight to make sure you sign in on the clipboard on this table up here. Uh, make sure your microphone's turned on and speak clearly into it so the folks at home can hear you. We can often hear you pretty well in the room just with the regular voice, but the folks at home can't at all without the microphone. Our next planning board meeting will be May 16th. Uh, 2017 at 7 p.m. in this room, which is the Matthew Thornton room. Uh, if anyone is here because of agenda item number seven, which is the potential redevelopment of the old Shaw's Plaza, um, that item will be continued and not discussed here tonight because there was a problem providing notice to the abutters. So if you came for that one, you need not stay and listen to uh, the other items. That one won't be won't, won't come up. Um, certainly can stay if you'd like to. Um, with that, I would also appoint our two alternates into voting positions with Nelson in for Lynn and Paul in for Vinny so that you guys are both voting here tonight. And that brings us to item two on the agenda, which is the Planning and Zoning Administrator's Report. Tim, what have you? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the board, in your packet, you'll find a uh, memo dated April 19th with uh, regional impact recommendations for several of the projects that are on tonight's agenda. Uh, staff recommends that the board find that they are not of regional impact as they do not meet the criteria. Is there any discussion regarding the staff's recommendation as to regional impact on the four projects listed, which is the Rochette's Oil, Watson Subdivision, the OVP, Shaw's Plaza, the Student Transportation Association? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we accept the staff's recommendation, although I would ask the staff that as and when item 7, which is the redevelopment of the old Shores Plaza, they actually bring their recommendation back again. Okay. Is there a second for Alistair's motion? Second. I'll second it. Yeah. Second by Councillor Koenig. Um, Alistair, why do you want to have it come back again? Well, we're not going to discuss the issue, so I, I mean, I still think this is going to be a significant but I'd like to have the chance. Of, I can see that the community development director is not happy with me. <laughs> well, the determination about regional impact doesn't have to occur on the All right, well, in that case, I would draw my that. motion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> if you don't. All right, if the motion's withdrawn, is anybody willing to make a motion with respect to regional impact? I'll make a motion. We accept the, all the recommendations, Mr. Chairman. Okay, is there a second for that motion? Second. Second by Councilor Koenig. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Uh, let's see, there's seven of us tonight, 700, zero, zero, to um, sustain the staff's recommendations on regional impact. Uh, any other discussion items, Tim? Uh, since I've only been back in the office for eight hours, no, I don't have anything yet. <laughs> Nothing yet. Um, any questions by members of the board for the staff? Um, Tim, I just had one item uh, to mention. Um, as you drive down DW Highway and you see our uh, property over here that's La Terrasas that's building the restaurant. Um, he's got his yard work all underway in a fashion that's all going to end up in the middle of DW Highway with a good rain. Um, and actually part of it already is. I don't know if that, that doesn't, certainly doesn't have anything to do with planning board approvals, but I don't know if there's any uh, town department that might Public address works. that Public before. Public Works keeping an eye on it. I think they've already got some dirt in the street. So. I, will, I will remind them <laughs> and, again. And some, yeah, we, some drive, good we all drive by it every day. So. Very good. Thank you. That's the only thing that I had in mind. Yeah. You brought to mind a question. Uh, there is a redevelopment going on on a property adjacent to Canals Plaza right there, uh, just to the south of it. Between uh, There's a building that's been torn down and another building going in its place. Uh, what do we know it, about that? That it was the, the old small little residence that was in between uh, there yeah. was demolished. The zoning board granted a variance to construct a new two-family home in there. It's, it's a residential structure, two-family residence. It's a two-family, yeah. yeah. Which does not require planning board approval. Okay. Any other comments or questions about any items around town? Okay. With that, move on on, move on on our agenda to item number three, which is the John J. Flatley Company as the applicant and owner, and this is continued compliance hearing as required by the conditions of approval for the site plan granted conditional final approval on December 15th, 2015 to construct 240 multifamily residences, clubhouse and associated parking and drainage improvements per the requirements of the flatly mixed use conditional use permit. The parcels are located at 645, 673, 685, 703 and 707 DW Highway 
in the I-1 Industrial Aquifer Conservation and Wellhead Protection Districts. Tax Map 6E, Lot 3133, 34, 35, 36. The agenda item is continued from our April 18th, 2017 meeting. Uh, Tim, is there anything that we should have as an introduction to this item? Uh, in your packet, you'll have Julian's updated memo. Uh, there were revised plans that were submitted at the last planning board meeting that staff has now had an opportunity to go through. Uh, so you see Julian's comments to that in this memo. The one thing I will note is, is that um, I was somewhat surprised to see the compliance hearing get continued because this mere fact that you held it means that that condition had been met and that the now the review of conditions would go on as it would for any normal approval. Uh, so there is no action specifically needed by the board tonight other than the recommendation that Jillian has that we uh, the board allow the staff the uh, authority to look at the changes regarding the trash and recycling building and be able to approve that administratively as there's been a reduction actually in the amount of impervious surface that's proposed as part of that uh, the overall project thank you tim i think um at that meeting where we were here last time the applicant brought plans at the meeting that we saw for the first time and so i think from the board's viewpoint you couldn't determine whether they were in compliance with their terms and conditions. So that's why it was continued to give everybody a chance to do that. Um, my understanding from Jillian's work is that there's some minor cleanup items and some cleanup items related to the peer review. Correct. But nothing significant. That's correct. Related to the plans. Um, and I know that the board members all have had a chance to take a look at it and maybe we'll have some other comments or questions to bring up and come forward. The only other item that's new is this um, recycling center, which um, could well be, if it's the, in the opinion of the board, um, minor um, amendment that the staff could administratively approve if the board so chooses because your hand because we're in a public hearing right now as part of a compliance hearing this essentially would meet the statutory requirement that because this was not a simple administrative change that could be handled in the normal course of uh, changes to the plans for conditional approval if the board so allows we would be able to consider this an administrative change if the board so see, so deems fit Thank you, Tim, and thank you, Kevin, for coming back again. Um, I always feel strange to tell to call somebody by name and then say, "Please introduce yourself." But <laughs> please introduce yourself sure. for the record, and then tell for us the, where we're at. Sure. My, uh, for the record, my name is Kevin Walker from the John Flatley Company. Um, I think the chairman summed it up uh, well. Uh, Julian uh, has gone through the previous comments, and uh, there's some minor comments remaining. As uh, as Tim mentioned, a lot of it is typos, changing, and changing the, the way a note is uh, written, that type of thing. Um, some documentation, final documentation from MVD and uh, wastewater, which uh, we can get. They, they gave their initial approval. As you know, we have the MVD development agreement already. Um, I will get something from MVD specific to the plan. Uh, same with wastewater and, and you know, whatever other uh, bodies uh, need to just uh, submit a, a letter to the board um, and again most of this appears to be uh, some notes and cleanup the uh, recycling area uh, that Tim mentioned we initially had an additional uh, 10,600 square feet of impervious area that's been removed the recycling area is 1,900 square feet, so we've got a net reduction of 8,700 square feet of impervious area. Um, that actually is a benefit to the property uh, in more ways than one. <coughs> um, that is, that's really it. Uh, the last one is we will uh, show the pedestrian bridge over the wetland area that we received approval from uh, the Conservation Commission and the Zoning Board uh, probably about a year ago. Thank you, Kevin. We're pretty minor. Any members of the board have questions for Kevin or comments after having had a chance to review the plan at a little bit more length? Nelson? Yeah, just, just a couple of questions, Kevin. Regarding the, uh, the state DOT approval, that has now been received by the town. That was a question last time, whether we actually had it in hand. So you've got all of the approvals except for DOT. Oh. DOT I spoke with, um, what are we on, Tuesday? So probably late last week. Uh, Bill O'Donnell is the gentleman I spoke, for, uh, spoke with from DOT. Uh, he expects to have the plans reviewed and sign off by the end of the week, but I'm figuring within the next week, week and a half. 
He's got no issues remaining. He had none to start with. What we were doing with DOT is we had all the DOT comments addressed, but he said don't submit anything until we're done with uh, our MVD uh, okay. development agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, work there. So that was just done the last time we met two weeks ago. So we got those plans into them, I think, the following Wednesday. And uh, he's just needs a couple of weeks to take a look at them. From, from my understanding, Nelson, DOT wanted to make sure that any impacts that the water line connections into the state right of way had were resolved and approved yeah. by MVD before they went through the permit process. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think also Kevin had the foresight to talk about his DO setups of the permit and whether the read have that tonight or whether we should look at them for the next meeting. And I think the consensus of the board was that, as we usually do, we would look at that as a condition of approval that the staff could determine. So. Yeah, yeah. I just wondered if it was here and if it, and I wanted to know if there was any improvements or changes to Route Three beyond what's shown on that plan right there. It's sort of they sort of go right up to the border of the plan. And I didn't know if there was anything more that DOT had asked for no, as uh, part of this. D DOT was okay with the widening. Really, the everything was all lined up. The, the, the question over the past, unfortunately, year has been uh, the water line. So yeah. uh, we've come to a resolution on that. Again, that water line will go connect the 16 to the 12 down to Priscilla Lane. Uh, got a verbal okay from DOT on that. That's going to be uh, part of the permit. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, but there's no other. No other widening beyond what we show here on these plans. On this plan, no, right? No. Yeah. 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 None that was required as part of the multifamily part of the project. Right. That will be re reviewed yeah. each time another phase comes yeah, in. Yeah, depending I, on I what. I realize that. I just didn't right. know if they had included anything in this phase. Yeah, the, the widening, so we'll have two lanes on DW heading southbound. Mm -hmm. There'll be a left turn lane to turn into uh, the apartment development. The other lane will be allowed to go straight without uh, having to stop traffic, mm -hmm. back it up. Yeah. Um, and as Tim mentioned, as additional developments come in, traffic study will be looked at again. Yeah. Um, it'll be evaluated. Mm -hmm. I mean, right, right now, uh, I think there was a proposal based on what was originally drawn up with the uh, uh, the mixed use development. I think there was an additional traffic light at one of the other entrances to the site. Yeah. Um, but that'll depend on what's built. If, yeah. know, if mm -hmm. we come in with yeah. a uh, a small building it, it may not be needed at that time yeah but will be evaluated it will be evaluated okay uh, we have in hand then that study that was done for the the overall the traffic study yeah that was submitted and reviewed by peer review two years ago and we have it on file yes absolutely because we may have other uses for yes. it thank you yes thank you thanks Nelson any other comments Mike I just wanted to clarify the sure. note that tip um, Julian had about the bridge for the wetland. There, in fact, is a bridge, right, that you're proposing. Yeah. Well, the, right now there's a, a couple of like planks that, that cross over a small portion of the wetland. So we're going to actually pull that up and put something more solid down, and uh, we're going to mark the buffer zone, uh, put some signs up, kind of describing the wetland, that type of thing. Right. My understanding is that. Um, after Jillian wrote her memo, she had a closer look at the plans and that the bridge is reflected in here. It's in the plan. I don't remember which page it's on. I see it too. I just want to make sure that it wasn't something different that she was referring to. No, I think that was it. Thanks, Mike. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Uh, and are there any abutters or citizens who wish to weigh in? The issue before the board is simply whether they're in compliance with the conditions of approval, um, but we're welcoming the, you know, the public to weigh in and let us know about anything that you'd like to about the project. Uh, you can either sit at the table or use the microphone, whatever you're more comfortable with. Just make sure you sign in on that clipboard. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll try to make this quick, and uh, I just want to touch reiterate. the button on your microphone. I don't think you're on. Oh, there we go. There you go. Uh, I just want to take a second to reiterate something Hang that I'm sure has been said. Uh, Introduction yeah. first. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Mark DeGrossalier, uh, property owner at 12 Lantern Lane. Thank and you, uh, yeah, as I was saying, I, I want to reiterate just quickly something I know has been said many times over the last uh, probably year and a half or so, and that is to ask that the developer give uh, consideration as much as possible to the property owners on Lantern Lane uh, who abut the property site. 
or the development site as much as possible as we go through the through the process here and certainly of, of critical importance to us is the buffer zone which I know you've heard many times before uh, but certainly whatever we can do to maximize the size and the effectiveness of that buffer zone you know would certainly be appreciated um, one of the things I, I want to say that you know folks who are familiar with the site we're very fortunate that we have a good deal of you know tree growth and vegetation that already exists within that buffer zone um, and you know, I'd certainly like to see that kept, um, if at all possible. Uh, I know we've seen all too many developments, and the first thing developers do, oftentimes, unfortunately, is come in and wipe the site clean. And I would hope that that doesn't happen in this case. And I would ask that, you know, we keep as much of that in in place as we can, because that will certainly, you know, help to, you know, um, you know, improve the effectiveness of that buffer and help us retain as much of the enjoyment of our properties as we uh, enjoy today. So. So that's really it. Thank you for the comment. I think the developer is committed to leaving the, essentially the existing trees and all of that vegetation there that it won't be disturbed. Plus, there's another provision in our approval that helps with that, and that is there's some parking lot that they've put on as a tentative uh, requirement where they're not going to build it until they determine whether they actually need it once it's in operation. So that's another area that will sort of keep them back away from your property as much as possible. Um, they do they are required to have that buffer zone so it's not optional they don't get to tell us one thing and then do another out in the field so perfect excellent well thank you for your time thank you for your input okay. you. is there someone else who would like to weigh in I'd like to, we'll please sure what the heck. come on no. forward <laughs> Rick Foot, uh, 129 Indian Rock Road. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Uh, Rick Foot. Rick, thank yeah. you. Um, Indian Rock Road, obviously I don't live anywhere really near there, so it doesn't really affect me that much. Um, I look at the plans, and obviously he's done a great job of laying his plans out and everything for all he's got to do and everything. Uh, I just like to say, you know, my statement is I'm, ag I'm against the whole project. I don't think it's good for the town, but my, I'm sure my, my thoughts don't really make a lot of difference here in the whole scheme of things. I'm kind of late to the program, obviously. I just as soon say it's, see it stay as open spaces. I think that would be better for the town. But, yeah, my two cents, I feel like I just, you know, add that in as much as I can. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the input. Anyone else wish to weigh in and offer the board some information? Seeing none, going once, twice, close the public hearing. Any more discussion by the board? I think, as Tim indicated, no particular board actions required on the compliance hearing piece of it. Um, there should be some indication by the board that we are uh, okay with the idea of a uh, administrative approval on the recycling business that they wanted to add to their plan. But other than that, no, no action necessary. Correct, Tim? Correct. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we accept that the John Flatley <coughs> Company have complied with this the need for a, con a compliance hearing and we ask that where there are some changes in which we know specifically the recycling building that should be actionable by the staff without the involvement of the planning board second for that motion second, second. by Nelson any other discussion all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed any abstaining 700 zero zero for that action Kevin thank you for coming thank back you, appreciate it. Kevin do you have an idea when you might start things we got to get the plan signed first. <laughs> <laughs> We're not there yet. Uh, yeah, okay. Not this, this summer. This, uh, this summer. Um, That brings us to item four on our agenda, which is Frank Trudowski is the applicant and owner. Review for consideration of an amendment to a previously approved subdivision requesting a waiver from section 4.13.1A of the subdivision regulations pertaining to driveway slope. The parcel is located at 15 Valley View Drive in the R Residential District, tax map 5C, lot 142. Tim. Is there anything that we need to know before we hear from the applicant? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, most of you, I think, are very familiar with the Valley View uh, subdivision and saga that took place over the course of about two and a half, three years uh, with the planning board with the calling of bonds and the revoke, revocation of an approval. Ultimately, the two-lot subdivision that was uh, granted and approved by the planning board has uh, 
Move forward, uh, Mr. Maggio, who was the previous applicant, is no longer involved with the project. Mr. Tarowski is now the owner and the applicant for the lot that in question. Uh, the home that was built on the lot, the driveway in a couple of locations does not meet the 10% slope requirement from our subdivision regulations, and therefore uh, Public Works and Community Development cannot sign off on a certificate of occupancy uh, without the board granting a waiver from that requirement. Uh, so Mr. Tarowski is here in front of you today to ask for relief from that requirement, and should the board uh, consider the, the uh, request uh, to meet the requirements for a waiver, you certainly could grant that, in which case the staff would then be able to sign off on the CO. Thank you, Tim. Mr. Tarowski, come forward. Grab a seat, sign in, and when you're ready, tell us what you'd like the board to consider. Frank Twardowski. Okay, I don't know if you've seen the plan. Why well, would okay? And uh, I had the uh, driveway done once. The engineer set the grades the first time, and the top guy did paid it for uh, paid it first time, and it didn't meet the town speculation grades. So, uh, so I had the engineer come back with the hot top guy the second time to work together. And uh, the first time on, on, on the plan, the bad spot was on top of the hill. Had around a station of, uh, of uh, 121 or to 126. The first part of the first time the bad spot was okay. And now when I had the engineers and the hot top guy come back and work together, they moved the uh, they moved the uh, bad spot when I drive away from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill. <laughs> so I'm kind of in the middle of what to do here, you know. And and I've been asking everybody what I should do, and they said, well, I want to go for a waiver. But if I do it again, will I end up with a, a third time to the bad spot? I tell you, I'm kind of caught in the middle here. I had the hot top guy and engineer work together all day long one day. And uh, but they still come out wrong. So I don't know. The, what to do the one thing I would add to Mr. Trowski's uh, testimony is, given the fact that the house is constructed, that's a fixed location now. It's not like we can move the house back another 40 feet and reduce the slope of the driveway, make it more gradual. <coughs> We're kind of limited by the location of where the house was constructed. Uh, the overall average slope of the whole driveway does meet the requirement, but there are locations that are just over the 10 percent. Um, requirement by there's the one well, on the plan. There's one little spot if you're on a plan. There's one little spot, okay, that can like maybe go on five feet long or something. That's going to go, it's all like 10% all the way up, okay. The first time it was good all the way up to the top. All right, then there was a little spot that went 11 back to four. And when I was working with the engineers that day and the hot top, uh, go do it again, I said, no, we're going to drive the front of the house at 4%. So take that 4%, drop that down to 6% down to 10% and take that 11% out of there. But I just kind of couldn't convince them of that. So they didn't quite get it done right. Right, so uh, they decided that they're going to take out just that small piece, they decided to go from that way up top to the bottom. So you say it's about a five or 10 foot length that's too I'm, steep? The, the piece that's too steep is about five or 10 feet long? Yeah. Okay, and how much too steep is it? Do you know what percentage the grade is? It's of, uh, For that bit? Yeah. It's on, on, on the back of uh, where's our, where's that, uh, on the, this is in here. Uh, he made it for a town. You got the, the one was right, right, right there. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Let me share that with the board members here, and then. I need you to stay where you can be heard with the microphone. So what you've offered me is a hand-drawn sketch. It shows that there's a small section close to the bottom that's at 11.5% slope, um, but that the average is 9.75 across the whole thing. So there's some sections that are less than that. 
Let me pass this around so everybody can have a chance <coughs> to take a quick look at it. And that was offered by your engineer? The engineer do have to be sent back to Al. Um, you got to be by the microphone or they can't hear you at home. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. The, 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 the engineer, Keith Nordstrom, made that up. Like, and they sent it to the town, the car, I guess. Okay? If you just turn okay. it over, you can see the, the, where it came from. Okay. Mm -hmm. I got you. Mike? Was there a boulder or something there that made it? No. I, I, no. I really, yeah. there's nothing in there, no, okay? No, okay? But they just moved the, the first the part that bothered me the worst, okay? They moved this, that, there's a little hump like that on top of the driveway. Oh, okay. Okay, when I had the engineers and the hot top guy work together, okay, they moved the hump from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill. <laughs> and so, they couldn't quite get it all right. Mr. Chairman, um, my view on this is that were this Mr. Maginot speaking to us, I would have tell him to demolish the house <laughs> and, because we so fed up with him. However, given Mr. Todorowsky's effectively stood up and sort of done his very best to put this project to bed, I think we should recognize his efforts. And although we don't like the idea of a waiver, I think we should grant a waiver. It's not a major issue. And I think we've just got to recognize this particular project was fraught with problems and Mr. Torvask is trying to make it finish and I think we should go ahead with it and give him the waiver. Other comments? Paul? Mr. Torvask, you said it's only about a 5 to 10 foot range that's out of, out of code. It's only a 5 to 10 foot range, you said? I the, length, the length of driveway is only 5 to 10 feet long. That's out of code. The driveway, I mean, you know, there's only one, one little bad spot, right? Yeah, the bad spot's only 5 to 10 100, feet. I'm going to drive on a tank, you see it's like 130 feet long. Yeah, but the bad part, the part that's too steep is just 5 or 10 feet long. Yeah, yeah. And it's only 1.5, from the drawing that you've given, it's only 1.5% above what it needs well, to be. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Um, Tim, is, do we need to take any public testimony? Any members of the public or the butters wish to weigh in and offer the board any considerations on this proposal? Seeing none, close the public hearing. What's the will of the board? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion which effectively encompasses what I said, that we would grant a waiver for this particular project with it being clearly I recognized it was, it's a tidying up exercise and will not be used as reason in the future by any other developer. Yeah. You're too statutory. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, I always forget that bit. On the basis that the strict, the strict conformity would pose an unnecessary hardship to the applicant and was not contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulations. Is there a second for Alistair's <coughs> motion? Second. Paul seconds the motion. Um, Tim, as a part of this motion or approval, is there any necessity for us to require the applicant to have an as-built plan or anything that records this on an actual plan or no? There will be the plot plan that is required as part of the CO process that will be submitted to my department and to the building department. That so that's going to happen that. regardless Correct. of what we do. Regardless of what you do, that. that's a requirement for any CO on a residential structure. Okay. So we don't have to deal with that piece of it. Um, any other discussion or comments or questions by members of the board? <coughs> All in favor of granting the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Seven zero zero. Thank you, Mr. Trudowski. You're all set. You'll get a letter from the staff that tells you what to do. Uh, who's got the, the profile? Oh, I thought we were going to keep this. <laughs> uh, perhaps it should be part of the file. It's yeah, well, you know, it's probably one to Tim, and he can copy yeah. it and give it back or whatever you need. Make a copy and give back to tomorrow in the office. Okay. The next item on our agenda is item number five, which is Rochette's Oil Service, incorporated as the applicant and Wiley Real Estate LLC as the owner, a review for acceptance and consideration of final approval for a waiver of full site plan for an expansion of an existing non-conforming fuel storage and distribution business. The parcels located at 658 DW Highway in the C2 General Commercial and Aquifer Conservation Districts and Wellhead Protection Area Tax Map 6E2, Lot 13. Tim, is there anything that we need to know before we hear from the applicant? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, this project was granted a variance back in February from the zoning board to allow the expansion of the existing non-conforming fuel storage and distribution business. Uh, they are now before you to uh, do the uh, modifications to the site to allow for them to do a fueling location uh, to replace a 500-gallon propane tank with a 1,000-gallon tank uh, for retail propane sales. 
Uh, the memo that was provided uh, by Julian uh, late last week has now uh, been supplemented by a letter from uh, the Fire Marshal, Captain Manuelli. You should each have a copy of that uh, in front of you at your station. If you don't have a copy of that, um, in that memo from uh, Captain Manuelli does raise I'll get another one, uh, some concerns about the ability of the fire department to move forward and grant this based on their requirements and regulations. Uh, so there's a series of six bullet points that I would recommend the planning board incorporate into any uh, approval motion that is made uh, tonight. Uh, there are some things that uh, will need to be uh, addressed both on the plans and with the fire marshal for compliance to uh, the building code requirements and the fire code requirements. Okay. Thank you, Tim. I know that this is a new memo for you. Do you do, let me give you a moment to have a chance to read through it. And I know that it's whatever response you're able to give is sort of putting you on the spot. Um, so we'll sort of talk through that a little bit and make sure that you've had an appropriate amount of time as much as you'd like to yep. consider it. Okay. I'm Ralph Freeman with Rochette Oil Service. Hi, Ralph. Um, yeah, our engineer was working with the fire chief the past couple of days um, regarding these issues, and we, we put together a new plan um, that I think addresses most of them. I have a copy for all of you. change the only change in this plan is um, with the tank itself in the in the front of the building um, it's been somewhat repositioned and and covers the setbacks that were that are required by NFPA 58 um, which is 25 feet from the abutting property the property line 25 feet from the building and 25 feet from the um, from the road um, also we have the um, bollards uh, indicated there that will be in place for crash barriers and um, and the fence around the um, the, the tank itself um, I have a copy of the um, actual tank uh, unfortunately I don't have one for each one of you but if you wanted to see you hand it to Tim I'll pass around or uh, take install that's the actual okay. piece of equipment and then that's it gotcha Thank you for this. Let me pass it around to the folks. And I don't mean to chase you back to your table, but the folks at home can't hear you when you're standing yep. up here. So, so, so let's go this way first, and then we'll pass it back down that way. It's basically the technical specs for the tank. Okay. So normally, it, when you, uh, if you have the locking cabinet on one of these filling stations, it's not required necessarily for a fence to be put around. But we have no problem installing the fence, um, and. Uh, um, and obviously the crash barriers also. Um, the tank will be placed on um, six by six inch, four foot long um, lentils with gravel um, under uh, to satisfy the uh, Conservation Commission's concern about water runoff. Um, that would enable the water to, you know, go into the ground. Okay. Any runoff. So you've got enough room on your site to put it 25 feet back from your property line and 25 feet back from your building. Yes, sir. And it'll fit in there. Yes, sir. Um, and now your property line is not the edge of the pavement. It's back from the edge of the pavement 12 feet because they got the DOTs right away through there, correct? So it's back. It, 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 um, I just want to make sure you're measuring your 25 feet from your property line, not the. Draw that from the road or from the. Yep. Looks like it's only 18 for me, but. Looks like Here's it's from the road. Here's from the property line. It's, it's I was looking at the front property line by the road, though, not the side line. The road the, is is 25 feet right here, mm -hmm. through yep. the edge of the tank, and we really. We've got more than that to the center okay. of the tank where the fill. I gotta. I know it's easier to point while you're here, but I got a plan. You got to stay over there okay. so they can hear you at home. <laughs> okay. 
you, of that. You can also grab the mic. If yeah, you can okay grab the mic you. if you want to. But I can I can see what you're what you're looking at on here. I see a dimension of 25 feet from the dark line indicating your property line to that first corner bollard um, in the parking area. I can see that your sign is six feet back from your parking area, which is also 12 feet from the edge of the property line. Okay. The other two, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, the other two dimensions seem to go to the center of the tank. Is that the way they want to do that? Everywhere. The dimension from the building, I, it looks like there's a line that continues to the center of the tank, but I think that that might be some other part of a label or something. Well, I'm looking at that one and then the one from the uh, south property line. I see 25 oh, feet I see, you're right. to the center of the tank. Mm -hmm. Is the that how they? reason for that is, um, I'll let um, oh. Matt. My name is Matt Buckley with Rochette Oil. Um, we measure, NFPA requires us not necessarily from the edge of the tank, but from a point of transfer. So the center of the tank houses our fill, it houses our vent, um, the regulator as well. So that's where we measure <coughs> our setbacks. Um, you know, okay, to that's build how they houses. do it. Okay, I yeah. just yes. Yeah. I, and I just want to note that 25 foot distance from the building to the tank is a fire code requirement. Does not necessarily complete to anything the planning board has a requirement for in our zoning ordinance. That's a building code requirement. Yeah. No question. So yeah. the Understand. result of that is that if the board <laughs> accepts the plan tonight and approves it, and the fire department says no, you've measured it wrong. It's not from the middle. It's from the end. You're going to get jammed up because you exactly. got to meet their our approval will require that you meet whatever their comments are sure yes. and, so and we, we pretty much come to agreement with you know our engineer and and the fire chief that 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 is i mean it's in nfpa 58 in the fire code book and um that that as long as those dimensions are met that no i understand uh, yeah. I'm, you yeah. you probably as well as i have encountered many many people who interpret the same regulation differently yeah. so sure sure <laughs> um, yeah. the one that you got to make happy is the fire chief on that so okay. um, so as far as our procedure Tim we've got to first accept this for review uh, this, this is a request for a waiver of full site plan review so I was going to note you you can go through the acceptance process uh, you could also when it comes to the multiple waivers that have been requested consider those all as part of the waiver of full site plan review if you so choose okay so, I think we should. so uh, <coughs> members of the board, do you feel like we've got enough information to accept the application as complete? Yes. Please, some may have a motion to that effect. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we accept this this application as complete and that we can make make the appropriate determination. Is there a second for Alistair's motion? Desiree, I saw you. I heard you, and I saw you. Desiree got the second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor of determining the application complete? Say aye. All right. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Seven zero zero. Um, and so the applicant has requested a waiver of full site plan review, which essentially gets rid of a number of formalities as well as a request for certain waivers that are involved here. Um, let's have some discussion about what were the specific waivers that you're looking for? Uh, it's the items in the memo. It's property line bearings, soil types and boundaries, location of buildings intersecting roads and driveways, stormwater topography, snow storage, and the pedestrian way sidewalk. I will note that this is across the street from the Flatley development where there will be an off-site sidewalk on the other side of the street. Any discussion regarding the items that would be incorporated in a waiver of full site plan review? Chairman, hearing nothing, I'll make a motion that we grant a waiver of full site plan review covering the section 70.5, wherever they are, as listed in the memo from Gillian Harris dated April 25th, 2017. So waiver of full, was a motion to waive full site plan review including the seven enumerated items? On the basis that strict heart, um, I don't think we have to do that in a waiver of full site plan review. Specific circumstances you, relative to including the other waivers. Okay, I got you. Specific circumstances on the indicate the waiver will carry out the spirit and intent of the regulation. Is there a second for Alistair's motion? So Nelson, you got the second. Any discussion items? I, I have Desiree. a couple. Um, I don't see any reference to buffers on here, especially because we're, we're adding that it's the residential property on the, this, the north side. It's the residential property. Uh, not north, sorry. South-ish? South yes, yeah, south, sorry. Um, 
So there's there's nothing listed for the buffer, but I'd be curious what is what kind of buffer is there or is required on. Next I, to the I think the label of minimum property line clearance per that is roughly that's the same distance that's required for the buffer category. I forget which one it is, but that is because also because it's an existing site that already has been fully developed. That's why we've included as part of the consideration the board needs to make as part of the full site plan review. Is ultimately by waiving full site plan, you're waiving that, landscaping exactly. and everything else. Yeah, but that's that's going to be ex exposed. Well, it's certainly like a larger tank with a fence out front. Yeah, you're, you're gonna. Yep. That's right in the front. So. Yes. Nelson got the second. Um, I think it's a worthwhile discussion. I don't think that it'd be too much to ask the applicant to do some plantings and things around the front of this to make it look appropriate for the neighbors. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and we would have no problem doing that. The Conservation Commission actually requested that we do some and that we use native, native plantings, plantings and, and such and, yeah. you know, nothing that's not much. And so. straw instead of hay and all yeah. of that other that they do. Um, did they ask you to um, limit your salt use on the site or yes. agree to no salt? Yes. And fertilizers um, and such and yeah. okay yeah. Uh, so you would be willing to add on to your plan some plantings around here to obscure from view somewhat the um, tank or the, the fence that's going to be around the tank yes sir. to kind of help that improve um, I think that at least for my part I would be willing to let the staff sort out what the specifics of that would be um, if that's okay with the board yes sir. And, and one other comment there's there's no bearings on the property Plan. So I don't know if that's that's fine with us because it's referencing other older plans. Just because it's an existing site, you don't have to put them on. Wavering full site plan review, you don't have it. Yeah. Well, I mean that's what I think they were getting at with the uh, 705 D5 D12 <coughs> and 5 D5. Are you just looking for a north arrow or? No, there's a north arrow on the plans. That's in the lower right hand corner. No, it was it was more. It's just strange to see a site plan without the bearings because the bearings are typically, like, I think those are like recorded information, so it's usually like just a part of the plan when you lay it out. But I guess because you're not tying it to the specific property lines, that's that's why it's not provided, so it's not wrong. If you don't waive full site plan review, they'll be giving us property line bearings and distances and everything else that's required by the regulations. Okay. How are we going to verify that it's installed per that if it's not marked on the plans? Well, I suspect the fire chief will have to sign off on all this lot, and I'm sure he will sniff round it with a tooth comb and looking for any issues. So I think we can probably trust Captain Man Manuelli to do a pretty thorough job for checking. Yeah, I tend to agree with that, but even without the bearings, I think that you're looking at 25 feet from the side and the front. That shouldn't be too difficult to determine even without some bearings. He's visited the site as well. So I think he's already done some some fact checking. Okay. Mike, it looks like with the bollards <clears throat> on the parking lot side that they'll impact that space. Um, so you've got two <coughs> bollards that are actually in those parking spaces. How much of that is getting impacted, or can you not? Do you not? Do you need those spaces? And do they need the total number of spaces that are there? Well, I, I believe we have enough spaces without those, mm -hmm. but um, I'd like to for those spaces to be utilized if we're able to. If it if it does encroach into the space, then <coughs> we wouldn't be able to use it. The spaces are pretty deep as well. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Usually they're 18 feet deep, so maybe you're going to lose two, something like that. So a pickup truck might hang out a little bit. <coughs> uh, certainly something bigger than a pickup truck, but it looks like it also has the way that the the driveway accesses is that there is some shielding with the way that that offset is. Is that right? That it's set back even further than the, <coughs> yes. Than the, than the park. Okay. So, so if push those back. yeah. So if they're safely. Right. Right. Okay. Thank I'm you, fine Mike. with that. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, so Rachel, you have another comment. I was just on top of that. So then, with with that recommendation that we're, we're saying, like the parking depth, the minimum parking depth is required. If we can take that from like the front of the bollard. To the back of the line, so make the lines a little bit longer. Yeah, just type your lines a little longer, so you still got yeah. 18 feet after the ball. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. So I got a 20 foot pickup truck. <laughs> <laughs> you can park on the other side. I guess I have to. <laughs> Nelson, did you have a comment or question? No. No. Yes. 
Are there any abutters or citizens who wish to weigh in oh, and off the board any information? I did have one more. Is this intended to be a self-service? And I think oh, you no. answered that. God, no. No. It's no, not. No, no, no. no. This okay. is a we service it. No. Yeah. Okay. Any abutters who wish to weigh in? Just, the board just to remind board? the board, you have taken no, you haven't actually voted on that motion that's on the table yet. Okay. Thanks, Tim, for the reminder. Uh, I still, I also don't see any abutters who wish to weigh in. Um, so I know that we're kind of doing that in the middle of things, but we we'll consider that the public hearing. That way, if anybody wished to weigh in before we voted on that, they could do so. Um, the, the discussion about the bollards has me a little concerned. You, you're you going to put the bollards out there, and those are supposed to be kind of a last act of defense for, to keep people away from hitting the tank. And I don't imagine you want your vehicles coming up to it. Are you going to put any kind of curb stops or anything on the parking lot to try and keep people from actually hitting the bollards? Or are we just going to use those as your stopper for vehicles in the parking lot? I mean, we, oh, go ahead. No. Well, we, we currently have a tank that's in this site now. Um, there is, you know, the small curb stops with existing bollards around the tank that we have. Um, so what we're going to do is, you know, with the enlarged tank, we're just going to sort of enlarge those bollards that come around. Wait, and you're moving this, and you're moving it closer to the parking spaces from the difference in these two plans here. So you're going to do something to keep the cars away from. So do you have some of those Certainly. movable we, concrete wheel stops now? We, we have those now. Okay. And, so can, so just can you continue just those so they'll be out in front of the bollards and keep the cars from actually contacting the bollards, at least unless somebody's, you know, running rampant over them or something? So Certainly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, I had and that would be something to add to the plan? That, one other question in the, in the disc narrative from Fusen O'Neill or Fusen O'Neill, whoever Fusen your engineers are, it says that you had a 150-gallon tank there, and yet... The other literature says it was 500. Yes, it's actually a 250-gallon tank, and I clarified that. <laughs> I clarified that in the uh, in our first meeting uh, uh, that it was listed as a 500, and it's a 250-gallon. And the fire chief is aware of that. So it's four times bigger that you're putting in there now. Yes, for a different purpose. But what's there now is just supplying fuel to the showroom displays, and this will be for a um, dispensing. Uh, no, Cindy, there's technical specs in the tank down there. Um, and you're expecting yeah. retail sales, so you're going to have people coming up to fill their tanks yes. for their RVs and their, their gas stoves and, and things like that? Yes. Just the small 20-gallon, 40-gallon yes. tanks, not necessarily the big 150, no. 200. Just the grill tanks. Mm. That's going to increase traffic in your space, or do you guys normally get that kind of retail traffic? It'll probably incre it'll cre increase it, yes, um, but we do get a lot of walk-in traffic. We get a lot of customers in that. As a matter of fact, that's why we decided to do this, is a lot of requests from that walk-in traffic that, that we fill tanks, since we are a propane company. Okay. It seems so like a lot to me, but I don't The new tank will be 16 feet long and three and a half feet in diameter. Right out there on the road. It's going to look poor, I think, but maybe you can dress it up or something. I just Thank you. Now, the fence that's required to be around it is simply chain link, but we as a board can talk about whether they put those slats in it to obscure the view through the tank, through the fence, or Desiree's already suggested that they do some plantings around that fence to obscure it. Um, and so let's talk about that if that's a particular concern for the board. <coughs> I don't want to have, you know, rush through an approval process if we... No, I would agree. I, I think that's a great idea. I think it looks like there's also a change in the sign, right? So there's a tank that has the logo on it currently that is your sign also that will be something... We have, we have, a, have a, a separate sign there. Okay. Yes. Okay. I didn't realize that. But, yes, I, I think it would be good to have some something there that dresses up that entrance. Um, and then you were just going to do the standard chain link fence at this point, right? Yes. Right. Um, it's tricky because I think um, the slots don't always necessarily make it look better. Um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. Um, I have more some plantings around it than than doing anything on the fence. It would yeah. help. Yeah. Are like you, you stuck said, with that buffer. sign location too? Does that sign location prevent him from moving it further forward? Let's just put it this way. If the sign gets modified, he's going to need to comply with today's requirements on it. 
Huh. Yeah, that's good. Well, the box you drew on your new map is smaller than the box in your original map. Is that a change in the sign, or is that just a different scale? There, there's no change in the sign. It's just the island that's There's no so change in the sign. Is the island just okay. landscaped? Or the is island has changed. So, uh, you know, it's just a little hard to fathom that and no change at all. Yeah. Uh, Does the island, I mean, the current island goes partway into that third space. The new island doesn't even cover the full second phase space. So either your sign is really in the center of that island or it's off to one side of it. If you look at your old map versus your new map, yeah. <coughs> I don't know that I have the old map with me, to be honest with you. Did you guys consider putting the New tank the back in the back where your other fuel tanks are. Yes, we did discuss that, but uh, tell me about that decision or that thought process. Because the uh, would require traffic going to the back back into the property rather than staying out to the front where the office is and where you know. You know so we wanted the tank out front so traffic wasn't going into the property where the um, other operation is being conducted. I know that might be a detrimental limitation in terms of the way your business flows, but from a planning board standpoint and keeping a propane tank out front versus out back, I don't know if it's persuasive in terms of <laughs> what our interests are to say that where you're you know, putting it in the back makes the people go in the back. That's good. But as I understand it, Mr. Chairman, if you put that tank at the back, the existing tanks at the back are primarily for the for the big the little trucks that fill up to bring fuel oil to the homes. You don't really want those trucks m mixing in with the, the general public. I would have thought that's it's right. a good idea to keep them apart. Personally, I would think um, one doesn't want cars in any way into crashing into or being run over by fuel tankers because that's going to just add to the fire chief's worries. But <coughs> I think seg as segregating the, ser the, the service area from the, the normal fuel deliveries makes a lot of sense to me. I think it does if you have a site that doesn't put it out there for the world to have a look at. You have to trip over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so if we're talking back to plan things, I think that we'd want to talk about since your tank is going to be, you know, three and a half feet high or however high it is, you want your plantings to be at least as high as the tank. Um, doesn't necessarily be as high as the fence. Um, something that's relatively dense and four seasoned so that it isn't going to, you know, thin out in the winter time. Um, it's going to do the best to obscure. Obviously, at an initial phase, plantings aren't fully grown. So if they're small and they grow into it within a reasonable period of time, I think that's a reasonable approach. But not, uh, you know, don't don't put one tree on one corner or one shrub on one corner and call it done. Right, right. Um, and, and that means a lot to us, too, by the way. I mean, we don't want it to be unsightly. You know, we, we want it to be functional. We want it to, you know, we, we you know, it's our goal for it to, to look nice, too. So which part of your fence opens up for people to actually get in there to do whatever you got to do? It will be on the end. Um, towards the parking lot? The, towards the parking lot, towards the parking space which is where the cabinet will be that um, houses the, the, the scale and the, and the pump the and such. And yeah. that's a locking cabinet also, by the way. That makes sense to me, but doesn't that mean you've got to keep the cars out of the parking, out of that parking area so that you can... And we may, may very well need to. Um, you know, we just haven't determined that completely yet. And I guess, as I said, we have plenty of other parking without you know, that space or two. Yeah, I think that you definitely do have plenty of parking. Yeah. Any other discussion by members of the board? One, one other really quick thing. So, I'm, I'm personally, I'm okay with this as administrative approval, but that's that's assuming everything can be built, you know, so that it complies with this. And then my my second part to that is when we're talking about uh, screening the the tank on the front, you also have your sign right there. So your sign's a little perpendicular thing. It's pretty close to where you end up putting that fence. So you're gonna find like, you're, you'll be able to screen it 
fairly well from the residential side, but like on the main streetscape, I think you're not going to be able to get a lot of vegetation in there without starting to obscure your sign. Mm -hmm. So perhaps, um, I don't know if it works because like uh, maybe doing um, the green greenscape in the fence, like growing something into the fence. I don't I don't know if that works with your operations, and follow up with like what's that. I'm not sure the fire department would be too pleased cool with that either. Well, I, stuff I, growing inside. We have the, to have the, certain setbacks yeah. from combustibles. Yeah. yeah, and I would think the same thing if you start putting slats in the fence. Those are generally somewhat flammable at a minimum. And, uh, or if you're even, if, even if you did like the, the nice plastic fence that really obscures everything, but that's, oh. that's all flammable too. Yeah, and then give you the security that you need for the, trying to keep, fence it in, in the first place to keep people out. Um, but Mike's point is well taken that those, Slides that slide into chain link fence aren't particularly better looking than the chain link fence was yeah. without them. Plus the combustible is the chilling. Yeah. Um, but if you know, <coughs> maybe a, maybe a growing plant's combustible. I don't know. Um, either way, you got to figure out how to how to do that. Um, but Desiree's point, uh, or one of her points, I think, is that if the fire department or the fire chief says that you've got this mostly right, but it needs some more adjustments. And those adjustments make it even more difficult to do screening. You're also going to have yourself in a bit of a jam where you make the adjustments that they want, but now you can't do the screening that we've required, and uh, all of those things got to come together. So. I understand, but but the screening that we've required will be waived if we approve this, because there's not, not if you condition on. specifically that you want. But I've been Wait. taking notes really? that. Right now, I've got three additional comments and conditions to put on, one being landscaping around the new tank, uh, at least as high as the tank at full growth and evergreen plantings, uh, the length in the stripes of the parking lots for the ballers to ensure they have the minimum parking space depth and to indicate the curb stops on those parking spaces on the plant. Thanks. Other comments or questions? Nelson. <clears throat> well, this is a difficult because we aren't looking at anything. We we can't really see what it looks like, and I'm sure everybody would have their own ideas of what made it look nice. And uh, I think the applicant wants it to look nice, and we all do, but we don't see anything here. We're all kind of imagining what it would be like. Um, I'm concerned about just letting go of this. Mr. Chairman, surely if anybody wants to know what it looks like, if you just go a bit further up, um, DW Highway towards the center of town, there is a tank on the hardware store whose name escapes me for. Hmm? Or farm supply, tractor supply. Tra uh, there, there are tanks in town. No, I'm yeah. thinking of the one actually. Beach Ferry Lumber, yeah. yeah, thank Beach you. Beach Ferry Lumber has a vertical. They have a vertical. They've got yeah, a vertical yeah, tank, which is even vehicle. more unsightly, if I may be so bold. Well, <laughs> well, I don't even know where that one is. We're talking about this one right here. I don't know where their tank is because I don't pay attention to the tank. Ferry and Lumber is always yeah. closed every time I ever try to go there. So yeah, no. <laughs> we'll be open. <clears throat> We're talking about this site right here, yeah. and I think you know I'm not using another site to excuse <clears throat> doing it again if it's not appropriate. Uh, no you know? question. I'm, I'm not talking yeah. about doing that. So are you? asking that there be some indication on a piece of paper where the plantings are going to go or what calling out what the plantings are because that's what I was talking about the town that the staff could figure out on their own well that's what I'm getting at is it, it, are we satisfied with the staff doing it on their own I, I'm a little bit concerned about it because beauty's in the eye of the beholder I'm not sure everybody would I don't know how the staff feels about being our our aesthetic uh, wing of the <laughs> planning board. It's not uncommon. This would not certainly not be the first time in the six years I've worked in Merrimack that you've put this on us. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't think I've had complaints on previous projects where we've done this. Uh, and essentially, it, it's, it's a matter of the applicant coming up with a proposed planting scheme that gets reviewed by my department, the fire department, the building department, that if it doesn't meet muster, they come back here and show it to you guys. Okay. Um, okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. So um, we voted on the conditional on the waivers, right? Now we haven't. Yes. Did we? We didn't vote on it. We, we haven't voted. voted. The motion is on the table. We, we haven't voted. Thank on you for the reminder. Waiver of full site plan. Um, if there's no further discussion on that motion, all in favor of a waiver of full site plan review, say aye. Aye, aye. Mr. Chairman. Any opposed? 
Any opposed. abstaining? One opposed. Um, no abstaining. So six one zero with Councilor Koenig opposed for the waiver of full site plan review. Um, any further discussion regarding the proposal in general? Is everybody comfortable with the three additional items that I had enumerated for the landscaping and the parking spaces? We haven't discussed the plantings yet. They're not in your list, are they? Yes, they are. Oh. Could you say it again, please? The three additional items I have, the, fir the two regarding the parking spaces are to lengthen the parking yeah. stripes from the bollards to ensure we have okay. sufficient yeah. parking yeah. lot depth and indicating the curb stops that are to yeah. be placed in those spaces. And the second for the landscaping is to indicate on the plan the new landscaping around the tank with the height to be at least as high as the tank height at full growth and that they be evergreen plantings. You want more? Okay. Is that okay? No, I can't. Yeah. Is, there, is yeah. there something in here saying that they need to get approval of the fire department <clears throat> in your recommendations? Or? That'll, that's one of the recommendations in the memo, isn't it? In the memo. I think. State approvals. We can add that as part of number six. Municipal departments, number four, I guess, might, right. might qualify. Yeah. Yes. That's it. Yep. Okay. So uh, the only other thing that's, I think, worth a little bit of discussion is um, what's the will of the board or, or what do we want to discuss if the fire department in their review of this makes some changes to what we're seeing in this plan that's just been proposed to us tonight. If the fire department says, no, this doesn't make it, what do we want to have happen? I, I guess I would need some additional clarification. If it doesn't make it from their perspective, from their regulations, but does not impact the planning board's jurisdiction, I don't think they'd need to come back here at all. They just need to make the fire department happy. If any of their changes result in something that would be zoning or site plan regulation re involved, they would have to come back from my perspective. Regardless okay. of, I, that's not something I would be comfortable handling administratively. That's so in terms of handling the NFPA, I mean, if, if this doesn't pass muster at the fire department, something will have to be moved or relocated or jockeyed around to deal with various setbacks and measurements yeah. and things. And as long as those changes don't impact any zoning or site plan regulation requirement, that would not need to come back here to you. Okay. If there's something that results in a change that does impact either a zoning or a site plan requirement, they would be coming back. Okay, that I'm comfortable with. Any other comments and or questions? So, and just for clarification, are you saying, Tim, that if they, for example, had to remove all three of those parking spaces, but they have sufficient parking spaces, they would not have to come back? That's correct. And they have sufficient parking spaces. The requirements saying? for bulk fuel storage or bulk fuel and the, retail sales and distribution is a total of five spaces is all that's required given the square footage of the building and everything that's out there. That and they have retail 11. sales. Yes. And then the, if the board determines it's necessary for more, you can certainly require more because that's within the board's power under the regulations. But in terms of the specifics of the regulations, five is what's required per the regs right now. I, I wouldn't say more required because usually we require more than it seems like people ever need. But in this case, with the addition of, of the additional retail sales, I mean, you've, you've stated that people come in and out of your office, and I know I've done that to pay bills. Um, but I, I would, exp I feel like this is going to add a little bit more traffic uh, than is normally there. Yes. Um, yeah, and so I'm a little more concerned yeah. about your parking capabilities because you don't want people going in the back using those lots that are down there. I've always seen the three up front used. Yeah. But it, I also feel like those three, at least two of them, shouldn't be used if that propane tank is going to be there and you're going to be wandering around in front there trying to fill tanks. Right. So, and it may very well is possible that they won't be used, it, depending on the configuration. Or maybe just pull region. them back four or five feet and mark it off and it's yeah. not part of the parking space yeah. anymore. It appears there's sufficient space to pull those spaces back away from the tank and still have enough driveway width to handle emergency yeah. access and vehicle yeah. access yeah. to the site. Yeah, I truly believe there is. But yeah, I think so too. I just I feel more comfortable if you drew it that way, but we don't have a full plan. So, as an existing non-conforming site, Tim, what are the elements of the existing site that are non-conforming? What makes it non-conforming? Uh, it's the use because it's in a general commercial district, and a fuel distribution type of use isn't allowed in the general commercial. So it exists because it predated predated zoning. Um, is there any element of of 
the normal spill kits and double wall tanks and all the other usual things that we consider that they're not in compliance with that we could not correct aware, in this? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Any other comments or questions? No. Okay. Uh, then, um, the, well, I'm sorry, go ahead, This isn't going to change your hours of operation. Right? No. You're just going to be open normal hours that you're currently open yes. and offering retail sales during that time period. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, we are reached the point where um, it's appropriate for the board to make any motion that any member chooses with respect to final disposition. Um, I'll make a motion that we approve this um, application um, with, sorry, with the Tim's uh, notes that he had added. To address the conditions from the memo. Yeah, to address the conditions from the memo and, and the ones that we discussed tonight yeah. as well, yeah. Second for Desiree's motion? Second. All seconds Desiree's motion. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Seven zero zero. Gentlemen, you're all set. Thank you. You'll get a letter from Tim with all of the details about what the conditions are that were already discussed, plus the ones we've added here tonight. We'll tell you what to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item number six on our agenda is Sanford Surveying and Engineering as the applicant and Barbara Watson as the owner. Review for acceptance and consideration of final approval of a lot line adjustment and subdivision plan resulting in a total of three residential lots. The parcels are located at 124 and 130 Amherst Road <coughs> in the R1 residential and Aquifer Conservation Districts. Tax map 4B lot 136 and 137. Tim, is there anything that we need to know before we hear from the applicant? Uh, this is a relatively straightforward project. The two existing lots, including one uh, very large lot that are involved in this uh, lift at it all or subdivision and lot line adjustment. The uh, proposal is to adjust the lot lines between the larger parcel and the smaller parcel, and then to subdivide that smaller parcel into three lots, which results in two additional new building lots that uh, would be available for additional homes. Thank you, Tim. Much better. <laughs> Thank you. Much better. When you've uh, gotten settled in, sign in on the clipboard and then introduce yourself and tell us about this proposal. My name is Bob Kilmer from Sanford Surveying and Engineering. I'm here uh, representing Barbara Watson in the uh, subdivision and lot line adjustment we just spoke about. Okay. Basically, it was uh, it, right now it is two lots. There's a 4B136 with an existing house on it, and there is 4B 137 you see off to the left hand side with the long driveway and the house sitting there but the proposal is I like to kind of do the subdivision first and then the lot line adjustment They're proposing to take the approximately 9.7 acre lot 4B 136 create uh, one lot around the existing house which would be the middle of the lot and then create uh, one lot on each side 4b 136-2 as you're looking to the right it'd be 2.7 acres exist uh, and it would be 119,300 plus square feet and it would have 108,000 uh, contiguous square foot wetland the the lot with the existing house would be minimum at 100,200 67 or 87 I'm sorry 287 square feet of contiguous upland 
4B 136.1 would contain 4.6 acres and have 152,000 square feet of contiguous upland. Then with the lot line adjustment between 136.1 and 137, they're taking approximately 1.1 acres and adding that to 136-1 to get a total of 5.8 acres finished for one for a lot in 136-1. The uh, what we're giving here also is the required a 25 feet from center line for the new right of way along Amherst Road for those three lots is required by the town. And they will have to get together with the planning staff and get a document to create it so that can be recorded. Um, there are, you'll see wetlands of brook and there's a pond down on the southern side. We, uh, have the 25 foot no cut buffer plus the additional 15 feet for the building setback. And what uh, again, this is a R1 zone, which is a they call it a severe soils. So that's where the uh, Hinkley loamy sand comes in. And the only other portion on this would be the uh, Ripawam fine sandy loam. And the, that's according to the uh, soil based zone map on file at the town. The, again, the contiguous upland would be consisting of the Hinkley loamy sand. Uh, the other thing is uh, we do, we have received state subdivision approval for the lot to the right and for the new lot 136 because it is reduced in size and lot 136.1 does not require it because it exceeds the five acre minimum. The uh, lots will be serviced by municipal water. There are two lines, one on each side of Amherst Road, but we will be using the one on the southerly side to, uh, again, the existing house is already hooked up, so there'll be two new hookups for the two new lots, 136.1 and 136.2, and they will be uh, also serviced by individual septic systems on each lot. Um, there, Pretty much it. there are a bunch of waivers here. I don't know if you have any questions first, how you want to proceed with that or? Sure. Uh, let's let the board ask questions and then consider whether the application is complete to be accepted. And then from there, we'll um, run down the list of waivers. And I think the staff has indicated to us that we've got a choice to either treat them as waivers or treat them as part of a minor subdivision regulation which in which they would not be necessary. The, the one clarification I just wanted to make to the applicant's presentation is that uh, the soil types on this lot really doesn't matter because this is all R1 by zoning map. Uh, so this is within the designated R1 zone based on our zoning map. So okay. 100,000 minimum would be regard, required regardless of the soils. Okay. Any comments or questions with respect to whether we've got enough information to make a decision and application is complete? Of a question. Yeah, that's a good <clears throat> What's the purpose of making the uh, the 136.1 uh, the L shape? It's including now, I understand, it includes a dam that's on that property. Yeah, he, he wanted the larger lot and to uh, be able to maintain the pond and all that on his property. And that pond impacts the, uh, the existing uh, large lot, 137. That pond is also on, Correct. on there, so it just looks like it's uh, it's setting up for some difficulties in the future, depending on ownerships and and so on. Yeah, I don't want to sell that part. This dam must have a permit too, it must have a state. Is it 
Hi, my name is uh, Chris Condon. I'm the son of Barbara Watson. Uh -huh. and, uh, hi, Nelson. How are hi. you? Good. Good. So uh, basically, the reason for the subdivision is because uh, my family and I are going to be moving next door to my mother uh -huh. to take care of her as she ages gracefully. <laughs> so, so anyways, we kind of <laughs> made some... <laughs> <laughs> right, Mom? <laughs> so, minus two so points. Kind of, the lot, the larger lot is going to be my particular lot. Yeah. So we wanted to preserve, you know, basically the, the pond would be kept basically in my yeah. area so I can, you know, go ahead and do what's necessary to maintain it. And then, of course, the lot line adjustment, um, I'm going to be adding a, a large garage, and it was kind of in the way of, the existing lot line, so that's kind of the way we. Fair enough. Okay, um, let me go back to the, the the is the dam permitted by the state or is that does it's it need not, to be? There's certain sizes of dams. It, no, it's probably uh, two feet wide. I wouldn't even call it a dam. Well, it, it, I mean it's a dam, right, but it's so, two yeah. it's two feet wide. I, don't, I doubt it's permitted by the. State. I mean, I, I mean, Harold, not, okay. Harold put it in I many, it many is. years ago. So yeah, I yeah. just, I just don't know the current regulations on that. It, maybe acre feet. Um, I can't remember the size off the top of my head, but it's based upon the acre feet of its, its reservoir pool. So yeah, I don't know how big this area is that it retains. Um, it has to also, if it's a four foot height difference, I think, or greater than a four foot height difference, from yeah. the top and the, the lower. Yeah, I elevation. remember the four feet. Is it four feet high? The dam? Well, we can tell from here. I, yeah. I'm not quite sure the height of it. Yeah. Okay, I, I just wanted to get that on the table, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Three to four feet. Yeah, you yeah. see the 198 up above yeah. here, and then this next is the 200 foot contour. You're not by a microphone, so the folks at home can't hear what you're saying. The uh, closest two contours to the uh, dam would be the 198 and the 200. So yeah. it could be, you know, three, three feet three. Yeah. vertically. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, okay. Other thank comments you. or questions with respect to whether the application is complete? If there's none, is there a motion with respect to whether the application is complete? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we accept this plan for review on the basis that the information we've provided provides enough information for us to make a determination. Is there a second for Alistair's motion? Second by Mike. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? 700 to determine the application's complete. Uh, does the board want to uh, ask any additional questions or take up the question of um, dealing with these waivers either as part of the minor subdivision or not Mike just if you could address the septic you know this area does have uh, some challenging soils right you talked about that mm -hmm. was, was it approved as part of the subdivision it was the septic systems approved by the state already no it's just subdivision approval just okay. to see to make sure the lots have the carrying capacity to be able to put a septic system on it right so one of the things that we talked about in the past, I think, when we look at Tamasian, or right, was similar types of soils, and that there was capacity if one was to fail, it, that the, site, the sites would support that similarly here, right? That they would be large enough that you could. Big difference between that and this is that was a proposed cluster subdivision, and okay. this is conventional. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions? Let's hear from the public. Are there any abutters or citizens who wish to weigh in and offer the board any information to consider on this proposal? Well, yeah. yeah. Come on. you got to come yeah. forward to the microphone. Gentlemen, why don't you let them have one of the chairs there? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Let's see. Uh, Richard Malone, 117. On behalf of, I think, all our neighbors, we're really pleased that this is happening. Okay, the fact she's not breaking this down into smaller pieces. And I think that's our take based. Everyone that's across the street. Well, we're really pleased at this. Thank you, Richard. Um, don't forget to sign in. And you know, it's so rare that we have anybody ever come forward and say, we love the project, go forward with it. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for doing that. It's, it's a treat for us. Does anybody else wish to weigh in and offer the board anything to consider? 
Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Um, let's go, uh, when you get back to the table, go down your list of uh, re either requested waivers and we'll, as a board, try to decide whether to treat them as waivers or incorporate them into the minor subdivision approval. Okay, the uh, first waiver is 4.04-B, uh, soil types verified and certified by a New Hampshire certified soil scientist. The next one is 4.06.1, the final plat being the lot line adjustment to show the entire outline of the entire lot as required. Requires a 200 foot scale, the actual area is shown at 100. That would be your, your first sheet. The uh, lot 136.7 being such a large site is just based on plans, deeds, and like that so we don't have the overall full lot area with bearings at distance as required. 4.06.1A, a plat based on a boundary survey with a maximum error of closure of 1 in 10,000. Again, it's just due to the size of 136, we thought it would be uh, prohibitive to increase that, but the one in 10,000 closure will take into effect the three new lots plus the area of parcel A. When you talk about the size of the lot, you mean 137, not 136, correct? Pardon? 137 is the lot that you don't have the correct boundaries 137, in the, the large, the large lot. Dimensions on. So you have some of them. The next one is four, 0.06.1C lot dimensions and areas. Again, that is basically due to the size of 4B137, but the three new lots and parcel A are, uh, again, bearings, distances, and uh, square footage and true areas. Final one, 4.061R to provide a paved pedestrian walk or sidewalk along collector roads. There appear to be no sidewalks along Amherst Road in this vicinity. We feel there will be no value to the public to construct a small isolated portion of walk at this location. Okay, thank you for going through that. Um, does the board have any comments or questions about the things that the applicant has proposed as either becoming waivers or being incorporated in a minor subdivision? The, the one thing I will say is the, the first waiver for section 4.04, .04, you can't consider under the minor subdivision. That is not one of the sections that is allowed by the regulations for you to say is unnecessary for a minor subdivision. So that one you will need to specifically grant a waiver for. 4.04 .04, you mean? Correct. Now the soils data, we've got some on our plan, but it's just not being verified by a soil scientist? Correct. But he's essentially showing severe soils, which are going to be the toughest to deal with anyway. So I don't know that it would serve any function to find out. I mean, they're not going to be confirmed to be worse than the severe soils, what he's already representing. Mike? Sure. Yeah, the two things I would say to that is one is that you're right in that, um, um, you know, the, the, it's not a um, major um, development where you've got lots of impervious and then you're trying to infiltrate and you're trying to redo the, the whole landscaping. It's going to be essentially a residential. Um, and so the, the only other aspect that I, I would see that the soil types would be beneficial was just as you go forward with the septic design, but they're going to have a licensed person come out to do that analysis. The, the applicant can correct me, but I believe that's additionally, it's, that's for the lot four, the lot uh, 137, the large overall parcel where no development is proposed to take place. That's what this waiver is applicable to. We do have soil information for the three new lots that are being developed as part of this application. So we do have the information just limited to the area of the new lots, but okay. not the large overall remainder lot. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes sense to me. Okay. Uh, so any other comments or questions about the requested waivers? Desiree? Just, just one question, partially in the spirit of Pete Ignan. Yeah. Um, Wait, we're talking with the different soil types here, and you have them on there. Uh, he's he's talked in the past, like the scale of the maps that are used to generate this, like knowing that that line is there and not, like that it's specifically in that location, like that the, um, sorry, I don't know the term for the, the ripple the ripple soil, like that it it actually occurs in that you know that 
swath Sorry. and not like more encroaching into the property? Well, the, again, the Ripawam is a group five wetland, you know, soil, and that would be similar to what the wetland scientist flagged out as a boundary for the wetlands to create the building setback and the buffer. So they'd use the same reference that you're using to put on it, your plans? It, not the same reference. They are, there is a slight difference mm -hmm. in the way they, they work. Okay. I think to Tim's point, though, we do have data as to the three developed in lots. The septic systems, yes. Yeah. Uh, in the areas of the septic systems. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, Pete's definitely beat into our head that the resolution of these um, maps from the uh, USGS isn't that great and um, that's why you have a requirement that they go get verified by a soil scientist. Um, so. Co other comments or questions? Since, oh, sorry, Tom. You said that the, the wetlands what has been flagged by wetland scientists? Yes, it has. In this area? Yes. Okay. And, and since from that is where you came up with your uh, square footage of contiguous upland? From that new flag? Correct. Okay. Using the wetlands. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Since 404 404B has to be dealt with as a waiver and can't be dealt with as part of minor subdivision, let's take up that question now. What's the will of the board with respect to waiving the requirement that the soil types be verified by a New Hampshire soil scientist? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we accept grant a waiver for Section 404 soils data subsection B on the basis that strict conformity would pose an unnecessary hardship to the applicant and the waiver is not contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulation. Is there a second for Alistair's motion? Mike seconds the motion. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? 700 to grant that waiver. Um, the rest of them can be either treated as waivers if the board so chooses or could be incorporated into a minor subdivision and determine that they're not necessary as waivers. Our, our path in the past has been to consider such things as being not necessary. Sounds good to me. With that, um, it would be appropriate if the board so chooses to make a motion regarding the final disposition of the proposal one way or the other. What's the will of the board? Mr. Chairman, having heard the praise from us, as, as you quite com, uh, remarked that it's so rare, I'd like to make a motion we grant final approval for the lot line adjustment and the subdivision plan as presented by the Sanford Engineering, subject to the details in the memo from Mr. Price, Robert Price, our assistant planner, dated April 24, 2017. Is there a second for Alistair's motion? I saw Mike first. We'll count Mike. <laughs> Any other discussion? Yes. Yes. So the, with the motion, he's proposing it as um, the lot line, but then approving the subdivision plan, so that's what creates the waiver or the, the opportunity for us to waive the remainders? Yes, in a minor Both subdivision. Both a minor subdivision a and a lot line adjustment allow for the board to make the determination that those sections are not necessary. Okay, so his motion is saying that it's a minor subdivision. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Other comments or questions? Nelson? I have one more question, Mr. Chairman. I just happened to notice there's a little, like a 50-foot right-of-way of land that comes down to Amherst Road on the, uh, I guess it's the, uh, let's see if this is north, that east, east side of lot 4C-20. And... Um, it's shown on the overall map, but it doesn't seem to appear on the, the detail, the 100 scale detail. Can you? Yeah, I mean, I get that. That's part of um, 4B137, which is part of what he you know, said he didn't want to you know, show on the plan and monument all the borders of. Mm. You know what we're talking about? And I'm not yeah. quite sure. Sure. So, if you look at your so you're on the overview plan on the yeah, first sheet, yeah, 200 scale. On the 200 yeah. scale plan, it's just not that section of that lot just isn't included in that inset. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. The it, area to the east of and it suggests 4C20. a different butter. That's yeah. That exactly that. 
That's what Nelson's talking about. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. What and about the it? detail, it doesn't show. And the abutter, it doesn't show. I mean, it shows another abutter by the name of uh, Raymond. No, that's the owner of the lot 4C, 4C lot 20, which that's, is that lot. Is Linda Raymond. Yeah. Yes, yeah. That little but thread is on the other side. That inset does not go <clears throat> further to the east, so you don't actually have the yeah. scale to show that 50-foot wide strip of the parcel. It doesn't go that far. It's on the other side of Linda Raymond's home. It's on the east side home. of the Linda Raymond parcel. Oh, that's right. It's on the other side. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. I. It's the it's the my the brook mistake. And then the house. And you then got, the you, right you understand that one? Okay. I'm, I'm a lot <laughs> off. Sorry. I'm off a lot. <laughs> okay. Now I understand. It's a minor subdivision, Nelson. So you're right. A minor discretion. <laughs> no, it's okay. okay. It's not. It's a configuration that we tend to draw attention to and not particularly favorably um, when you get those little narrow strips of something. Is that an area that's in existence for use for a driveway or a roadway or something? It's not determined at this point. Okay. It's just part of the lot that it's has part an, existence. Of an existing yeah. lot. Yeah. 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 We're not okay. touching it. No. Other comments or questions? Um, so we've got a motion to grant conditional final approval subject to the conditions in the memo. Um, any, if there's no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Seven zero zero. So you're all set. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Thank you very you. much for your presentation. That brings us to item seven on our agenda, which is Hoyle Tanner Associates and Associates Inc. As the applicant and OVP Management Inc. as the owner, review for acceptance and consideration of final approval of a site plan for the renovation of an existing retail shopping plaza. You don't even need to read it. The addition, I know, I'm halfway <laughs> through it, including the addition of 4,650 square feet of new restaurant space. The parcel is located at 360, 360 Daniel Webster Highway in the C2 General Commercial Aquifer Conservation and Planned Residential Development Overlay and Elderly Housing Overlay Districts, tax map 43, lot 1. As I, I mentioned at the outset of our meeting tonight, there was a defect in the notice to abutters for that project, and so we are obliged to allow for that proper notification to take place and take this up at our April 16th meeting, May 16th meeting, yes. Um, we do not have to There's do no, our usual no continuance and announcement because there will be notice to abutters, which is usually what we avoid the requirement for by making that announcement. Anything else on that one, Tim, that I didn't do right? Yeah. Can I just ask how long we knew this was how long ago we knew we were going to pull this? I found out when I was on vacation last week strolling along Myrtle Beach, I got an email saying that there was an abutter notification issue. Yeah. So it Jillian was let me know on Friday. On well, Friday. Yeah, on Friday. The packets like had gone week. out, and it was like almost immediately after that that she realized the notifications were, weren't right. So These were in the packet. Yeah. So she knew already when Apparently the packet I knew was right out. At, yeah. Well, either way, one way or another, I knew. I knew right I got the as far as I understand it, like I said, I was on vacation in North Carolina at the time. Okay. Well, I, my problem is that I knew that this was on the agenda and made an announcement at the town council meeting Thursday night mm -hmm. and then received the packet Friday saying that it was not going to be there. And I, it would have been I, nice if I'd known ahead of time. I would have, I, I have some issues with uh, the way things happen, which I will be dealing with uh, when in, the in people term, are in the office. Administratively. Yes. Thank administratively. Thank you, Tim. Item 8 on our agenda is Hainer Swanson, Inc. and Student Transportation, Inc. as the applicants and John T. Zyla as the owner. Review for acceptance and consideration of final approval of a site plan for a school bus operations facility. The parcel is located at 534 Daniel Webster Highway and 6 William Street in the C2 General Commercial and Aquifer Conservation Districts and Wellhead Protection Area. Tax map 6D, lots 1-1 and 1-2. Tim. Mr. Chairman, could I, before we even start, make a, make a simple brief statement? Uh, let, let Tim do his introduction first, just so we know any more details that we need to know about the application. That's fine. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, this is a proposal to uh, consolidate the two lots in question, to uh, raise the existing 9,500 square foot garage, construct a new 3,000 square foot maintenance garage bay, fueling station, parking area, and other associated improvements. Uh, for the uh, Student Transportation, Inc., which is the school bus provider for the Merrimack School District. Uh, this use was granted a variance from the Zoning Board back on February 22nd, uh, and the 
project is here in front of you to uh, move forward to the site plan review process. I will note uh, we do not yet have our peer review comments on the engineering for the project at this time. In addition, the uh, police chief has uh, requested that this go before the uh, traffic the highway safety committee, which will be taking place next week. Uh, so when you get to the point of the meeting where you want to make a decision on disposition, the staff recommendation would be to continue this to a date certain uh, in the month of June. All right, with that, thank you, Tim. Alistair. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a very brief statement. It, I believe it's common knowledge that I am a school bus driver indeed, and indeed for a three-year period I did drive for the Merrimack school system. However, during that period, the buses were operated by Laidlaw Transport and First Student. I have never worked for STA, the applicant, in this matter. I wish also to declare that my partner does drive buses for STA in Merrimack, but like me, has no financial involvement with the company except as an employee at will. Because my partner is on the local employee council, I have known of this proposal for some time, but I still believe the knowledge I have gained together with my understanding of the requirements of the Merrimack school system allow me to, to participate without any suggestion of impropriety. Thank you for that. I agree. Please introduce yourself and tell us about the proposal. Oh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. For the record, my name is Tom Zajac. I'm a civil engineer with Hainer Swanson in Nashua. Uh, I'm here tonight representing Student Transportation on their property located at 534 Daniel Webster Highway and 6 William Street. Uh, with me here tonight is uh, Greg Stinson, who's the Vice President of Operations in New England for Student Transportation. Um, also with us here tonight is uh, Steve Pernow, who is the project's uh, traffic engineer and will be likely up later to answer uh, traffic-related questions. Uh, as Tim mentioned, tonight we're seeking site plan application acceptance, and we were uh, advertised for final approval uh, for a proposed school bus operation facility uh, to be located on the subject property. Uh, I'd like to provide a brief uh, summary of the project, and then I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions you have. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, the existing site, uh, as I said, 534 Daniel Webster Highway and 6 William Street. It's actually two lots that will be uh, combined. Map 6D-1, uh, lots 1 and 2. Uh, about 4.3 acres. We're located in the C2 Commercial District, uh, as well as the Aquifer Conservation and Wellhead Protection Overlay Districts. Uh, we're abutted by William Street and a single-family residence to the north. Daniel Webster Highway and a multifamily apartment, apartment complex to the east, the FE Everett Turnpike to the west, and uh, the vault storage uh, vehicle facility to the south. Uh, currently, the easterly portion of the site is developed. It is a partial two-story multi-use uh, commercial building facing Daniel Webster Highway. Uh, some of the current uses in there right now, there's a karate studio, a hair salon, a uh, septic company has offices in there. Uh, there's also an attached garage that faces William Street. I'm sure as you've driven down that, you will see it uh, on your left. Access to the property is currently provided via site driveways, both on DW Highway and on William Street. Um, and then along William Street, as you make your way west, there's really just a sea of pavement there. There's no really defined curb cut as you make your way down um, William Street. Westerly portion of the property is currently undeveloped and wooded. There is a small wetland that's located at the rear of the site near the highway. It's shown on the plan there, uh, colored in blue, kind of straddles the property line. Uh, the site is... Yeah, I don't see any blue. I don't see any blue on it. Uh, more greenish blue. <laughs> <laughs> Not so blue. <laughs> Apparently I'm colorblind. Uh, the site is currently serviced by public sewer, uh, water by the uh, Merrimack Village District, underground gas and overhead electric and telephone utilities. Uh, a little background on student transportation. Uh, they currently service the Merrimack School District, and there are six schools, three elementary schools, one upper elementary, the middle school, and the high school. Uh, the Merrimack School District is about 3,700 students, um, and student transportation runs about 38 buses a day on average to service those six schools. Uh, they currently operate out of a f facility located on 14 Star Drive, which is about a two-acre site in the southern end of town. Uh, as Greg may tell you more about later tonight, this site is, is not exactly ideal for their operations. Uh, first of all, it's not centrally located compared to the schools they service. It's uh, pretty far down in the south end of town. 
and being two acres, it's, it's not quite big enough to uh, support the full operations that they're required by contract with the school district and that uh, we're hoping to solve some of those issues with the proposed project. Specifically, I'm talking about uh, the maintenance of their bus fleet, uh, fueling on site, and also washing the buses. Uh, so tonight we're proposing to redevelop the existing site into a school bus operation facility. Uh, as I mentioned, the existing lots will be merged and the uh, final site will be known as 534 Daniel Webster Highway. We're proposing to demolish uh, the garage portion of the existing building and to construct a new uh, approximately 3,000 square foot two bay maintenance addition on the back of the building. Uh, student transportation plans to occupy uh, a portion of the office space. They'll have about a four uh, full-time employees there within, within the building and, and maintenance space. Um, and it is their intent to uh, maintain the existing commercial tenants that uh, occupy uh, the existing building. The typical hours of operation are, are about 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. A little later on we'll talk about when specifically the buses come and go, but that's the general operation of the site. Uh, as you can see on the plan, we're providing 78 new vehicle parking spaces. So that is uh, parking for customers and employees in the front of the site uh, and along uh, the rear of the site on William Street because there is a back entrance uh, for a commercial tenant. Um, the southerly parking um, located along the vault storage property uh, is intended for the school bus drivers themselves to come and park as they uh, then hop into the school buses for the day and then leave at the end of the day. Uh, you will note we are 11 spaces short of what is uh, the minimum required by code. Um, I've dashed in some future spaces. There's six spaces located in the uh, southeasterly portion of the site on the master plan as well as an additional five spaces up along William Street. I did this to show that we, the site can support additional parking if needed, uh, but it's our opinion that, that we don't need 89 parking spaces. We do feel like there's some overlap between uh, the existing commercial uses and uh, some of the, uh, the school bus drivers themselves. I apologize. Um, in the rear of the site, we're proposing a parking lot for 55 school buses. Um, there's about 45 buses in the fleet now, if you drove by Star Drive and counted them up. Um, Obviously, there's some extras there and those that are waiting to be worked on. As I mentioned, there's about 38 buses that go out uh, each day. Uh, we've provided an extra 10 spaces uh, for future growth uh, of the school district or any expansion as needed uh, for student transportation. Uh, in terms of curb cuts, we're going to maintain our existing site drive on uh, Daniel Webster Highway. Uh, we're going to better define access points along William Street. As I mentioned, there's a sea of pavement in the existing condition now. Um, so I'd just like to talk a little bit about the parking circulation and, and the school bus circulation. So uh, as we move from the intersection of Daniel Webster Highway and William Street West, we've got an, uh, a really reworking an existing curb cut there on William Street uh, to provide parking and access for customers, employees. Also the, the, the next um, driveway will be also for customers, employees. As I mentioned, there's there's a rear access to the existing building. Uh, I believe the hair salon is in there right now. Um, the next curb cut, which is pretty wide, is going to be the first curb cut for the buses to use. They will enter the site on William Street and move in a, in a clockwise pattern around in, um, in a one-way motion, uh, leaving the site on a new curb cut off the cul-de-sac in the rear on William Street. Uh, we think this does an, a number of things. Uh, first, uh, a lot of times, the buses will uh, need refueling upon their return to the site. As you can see, we've got a concrete pad placeholder there for the, for the fuel island and above ground storage tank that I'll talk about in more detail in a second. Uh, it also allows the buses to then enter the maintenance garage as needed. Uh, they will then move, uh, as I said, in a, a counterclockwise motion into the parking lot. And then when they leave, they will exit onto William Street, um, which what that does is is it provides so that the lights from those buses are not pointing directly into the abutting property. I think the original layout we had contemplated that we presented to the, to the zoning board contemplated that the uh, site driveway on William Street there 
would be a two-way. In, in, in essence, you might have, uh, you know, at, at 6.15 a.m. when a bus is leaving, you may have uh, headlights poking towards that, that residence. So just uh, one thing that I wanted to point out that we're doing to be, to be sensitive to our, uh, our neighbors to the north. Could you repeat that pattern again of entry and ex exit of school buses? I think I missed something. Sure. The school buses will use the two, the two most westerly uh, driveways that will enter, as Tim's showing there. Onto Route 3, I'm off of Route 3. Oh, all school buses will use the, Willi the William Street intersection. Okay. 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 That's what, okay. Um, and then they will, they will move in a, counter, in a clockwise manner and, and continue out onto William Street. Okay. Thank you. Um, other site improvements include the fuel island, as I mentioned, to use uh, exclusively by the bus fleet, new landscaping and site lighting. The site disturbs approximately 170,000 square foot of area. We did apply, apply for our uh, alteration of terrain permit and our pending comments. Uh, there are no impact to wetland or wetland buffers at the rear of the site. Uh, and we do have some stormwater management improvements um, where there's no formal practices at the current site. Um, a couple key issues I wanted to talk about. We did go before the Conservation Commission a few weeks ago. The site is located within the town's aquifer conservation and wellhead protection district uh, associated with MVD wells four and five. Um, we did talk about, and, and student transportation was uh, accepting of uh, kind of the standard green snow pro certification and also the uh, use of no phosphate slow release fertilizers applied by a licensed applicator. Um, those notes are on the master plan. Uh, the conservation was also uh, interested in bus washing. So the, uh, my understanding is the current site on Star Drive, uh, bus washing is not allowed. They don't have an indoor facility and, and it's not allowed outdoors. Um, they currently use uh, an off-site location in town. Um, it was the intent um, originally for this project to wash uh, their buses inside the maintenance garage and we were going to tie, uh, after going through an oil water separator, tie into the public uh, sewer system. We did receive a comment back from the wastewater division that uh, this practice is no longer accepted in town and that there's going to be no new floor drain connections from these buildings. Um, and as you know, these floor drains cannot connect into site drainage. So um, essentially there will be a holding tank that will need to be uh, installed uh, with a liquid level alarm. Um, to service the floor drains. What's unknown at this point is, is whether student transportation will use, will wash vehicles inside this garage um, or if they'll continue to do it off-site. It's really um, a, a cost analysis for them. As you can imagine, if they're was washing a fleet of buses inside, they're going to have to be emptying this holding tank uh, much more frequently than if they're just emptying it uh, from maintenance of the bus fleet. So. Um, that issue is kind of still up in the air. But I did want to mention it because it did come up at the Conservation Commission, and at that time we represented we were going to be tying into the public sewer system. Um, the state-of-the-art fuel island and above-ground storage tank is going to be uh, proposed for the site. So this is for the fueling of buses as needed upon return to the site. There will be a full-time employee fully fueling the buses, uh, so the bus drivers themselves won't get out of their vehicles. It's a 6,000-gallon double-wall steel above-ground tank, um, continuous liquid level monitoring. The fuel dispenser will be mounted on a spill containment box, which will also be monitored. Uh, the tank dispenser and fueling area will be on a concrete pad, uh, which is also going to be large enough for the bus to completely fit on it. Uh, the pad, as I'm sure you've seen at gas stations and, and uh, other above-ground storage tank, will have uh, kind of a, a grooves uh, towards the perimeter. This is a positive limiting barrier grooves uh, so that if there is a spill, the runoff is self-contained within this pad. Uh, fueling deliveries to the tank will be performed on a weekly basis during normal hours of operation and will be conducted through a spill containment box. All system components will be designed by a professional engineer and is subject to DES uh, review and permitting. Um, I also would like to mention that it is not shown on the plan but uh, student transportation will be installing a six-foot high stockade fence on three sides of this fuel island um, to help better buffer it from William Street. Stormwater. Stormwater generally drains in a westerly direction 
towards the uh, turnpike. It's uh, then piped underneath the highway into Babusik Brook and eventually the Merrimack River. Uh, as I mentioned, there's no formal treatment practices on site now. So the goal of our design is to take advantage of sandy soils located on site, implement low impact development practices where possible to capture, store, treat, and infiltrate stormwater runoff. LIDs currently proposed on site include rain gardens, infiltration trenches, and an infiltration basin. The project will meet Town of Merrimack and DES alteration of terrain regulations related to qualitative and, and quantitative treatment. Uh, as shown in our stormwater study, the net result of, uh, of the project is that peak flows and volumes will be less than or equal to the pre-development condition. Um, one of the other points I want to talk about was uh, the steps we've taken to uh, minimize impacts to uh, the abutters on uh, specifically the single family residence on William Street. Um, the subject site and surrounding properties are lo located in the C2 commercial zone. So one of the goals of the project was to provide more green space and better buffering and screening between the current site and the existing residence on William Street. Uh, as I mentioned, currently the, the view from the budding residence of the property is, for lack of a better term, a dilapidated garage and a sea of pavement. Uh, so the, there's a number of site-related elements uh, included in our proposal to reduce the impacts. Uh, I spoke about the driveway and parking layout, which essentially tried to uh, limit the interaction of, of the buses as they leave with the driveway of the residence, so to minimize uh, headlights and glare uh, into their property, as well as uh, shifting the parking lot about as far back as we can into the site. Bus circulation will, will come from the rear of the site on the new access from the cul-de-sac. Um, we're also able to provide a wooded buffer, save some trees between William Street and the school bus parking lot to provide a little bit more buffering. Uh, we're more efficient on our driveways along William Street. Um, narrowing up the pavement and curb cuts uh, and introduce significantly more plantings and green space along that strip. Um, there'll be no spillover from site lighting onto their site. Uh, as I mentioned, a stockade fence will be installed around the fuel island and also the dumpster pad and uh, drainage improvements. So as a result of the site, right now if you've ever been out on William Street during a rainstorm, there's some localized ponding. The existing road is very flat. There's a leaching catch basin. Uh, near uh, their driveway and uh, the site is contributing a decent amount of flow to William Street. So based on our, our, our stormwater study, we're showing that we're intercepting nearly all of the flow from our site, um, which will significantly reduce the ponding on William Street. Uh, traffic. So a detailed traffic study was performed by Steve Pernaw, the project's traffic engineer. I'll provide a brief study and then Steve would be happy to answer any detailed questions you have. Uh, the bus facility will generate 320 trips, 160 entering, 160 exiting on an average weekday. Uh, these are broken up into four bus facility peak periods. Um, the morning bus departure, which takes place from 6 to 7 a.m., the morning bus arrival, from 8 to 9 a.m. The afternoon bus departure, 1.45 to 2.45 p.m. And afternoon bus arrival, 3.15 to 4.15. The reason I bring these up is because um, what we're showing in the study is that the peak periods a.m. and p.m. of Daniel Webster Highway do not coincide with the bus facility peak periods. The peak periods of Daniel Webster Highway are 7.15 to 8.15 a.m and 5 to 6 p.m. Um, I'd just like to point out that the Daniel Webster Highway and William Street intersection was analyzed and based on this analysis, it was determined that neither a traffic signal nor any auxiliary turn lanes were warranted. Uh, the staff report we received was uh, generally acceptable to our client in terms of the comments. Uh, we have not rec yet received comments from MVD or the peer review consultant. Uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, we've been asked to go to the Highway Safety Committee uh, meeting to respond to the comments uh, from the police chief. Um, in terms of the public works comments, they requested that uh, the applicant dedicate a 10-foot wide strip of land along William Street 
to an, uh, correct an existing issue with the right-of-way width not meeting town standard. Uh, most of the right-of-way is 40 feet out there, and then where that last red plant is, it jogs into 50 feet. So they're essentially asking us to give them 10 feet to, to make that right-of-way uh, a standard 50-foot width. Uh, the applicant is, is fine with that. The only issue is that if we dedicated 10 feet, it would put the existing building along William Street into the front yard setback. So I believe uh, there's a provision or it's been uh, done in the past where there's a, a, a deeded easement uh, that will the roadway maintenance and widening easement would be that will substitute that dedication um, essentially f you know serve the same purpose but won't put that building into a nonconformity. Uh, the second request Public Works had along William Street was to widen pavement. So right now, William Street is about 21 feet wide. They've asked us to widen it to 24 feet, so essentially three feet on our side of the road would, would bring it up to standard, uh, which student transportation uh, has agreed to. Um, we've also agreed, we're not showing it on the plan right now, but we're gonna provide a sidewalk along the Daniel Webster Highway frontage, um, and then, but we are gonna ask for a waiver request for sidewalk along William Street. Um, getting to the waiver request, I apologize. I sit, submitted a, a late in the day uh, waiver request today. I'm not sure if that made it into your packets. I have copies here uh, for the board members. Um, So again, I apologize for the lateness of the waiver request. I'll go through, uh, there's two of them, um, and I will detail out um, what we're asking for. So the first waiver request is uh, for the sidewalk along William Street, section 7.05D19, requiring that commercial and industrial non-residential site plans provide a paved sidewalk, a uh, paved pedestrian way or sidewalk along all existing or proposed streets. Um, this waiver is being requested for the following reasons. The subject parcel contains 240 feet linear feet of frontage along DW Highway and about 770 linear feet of frontage along William Street. Currently, neither Daniel Webster Highway nor William Street contains sidewalks along this property. There are no sidewalks on the residential property to our north. Uh, the vault motor storage site, which abuts this site to the south, contains a combination of striped pavement and recycled asphalt pavement sidewalk that extends to our property line to the south. As I mentioned, we will connect this sidewalk in this location along our Daniel Webster Street frontage. We're not asking for a waiver of the Daniel Webster sidewalk. Uh, this site is unique in that it contains frontage on both Daniel Webster Highway, William Street, and also abuts the turnpike to the rear of the site. It is our opinion that requiring a sidewalk to be constructed along William Street will be of little no, to no benefit to pedestrians given the fact that the turnpike precludes any future pedestrian connectivity at the end of William Street. Uh, as requested by the Town of Merrimack Public Works Department, the applicant has agreed to make improvements to fix existing issues related to the public right-of-way and pavement width along William Street. It is our opinion that requiring sidewalk improvements along William Street or a monetary contribution equal to would be an unnecessary and additional cost to this project given the above mentioned roadway improvements. Moreover, sidewalk improvements along William Street will likely involve curbing and drainage improvements which would further add expense to the project. Uh, the second request, uh, I will paraphrase a section 12.043E. Um, it's a building design standard that requires that all buildings uh, have a um, have a door facing a public street. Um, the existing building does not have any doors facing William Street, only Daniel Webster Highway. Uh, the existing, I mean, I'm sorry, the proposed maintenance building wants to continue that. We do not want to have a public uh, door or a door facing the public way along William Street. Uh, the intent of the regulation is to provide a safe and convenient uh, 
pedestrian way from the public right away to to the building um, this is a, a private garage that will be used by uh, student transportation employees only so we do not want to promote the uh, pedestrian movement towards this maintenance garage So in summary, we believe the application is complete and conforms to the site plan regulations. We believe the proposed redevelopment is a good use of an underutilized property in town and will improve the bus service provided to the town of Merrimack. Uh, we agree with the conditions and stipulations outlined in the staff report and we seek your approval. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very clear and well explained. I appreciate that. Um, here, here, Mr. Chairman, I think I have to say that it's one of the best presentations I've heard in a long time. Um, with that, does any member of the board have questions um, for the applicant, noting that our first bit of business would be to decide that the application is complete or not? Seeing the <coughs> questions. Yeah, I was going to make a motion to accept the application as complete uh, so that we can take action on it. So second from Mike's motion? Desiree's got the second. Mike and Desiree have the motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? 700 to determine the application is complete. I know that we're probably going to have quite a bit of uh, public input um, into this project, and I know that we're also waiting on some uh, peer review results. Um, but before we do that, does the members of the board have any general discussion questions about the proposal um, that the applicants described for us tonight? Well, I've got about 10 or 12, but they, they go all over the place, you know, and maybe it'd be better to finish, let him finish his presentation and then. Uh, I, I, did you have more to your presentation? <laughs> that, that was all I got. <laughs> no, I, I thought Mr. Pernod was going to speak. I thought. I, I think he's here if we have questions about the, okay. uh, and, and I do, but you do as well, so let's let. And I will note that I have not developed any traffic questions yet because we have not seen the peer review at this stage. Yeah, okay. Well, I went ahead and got some questions anyway. And <laughs> Go ahead. And, uh, the, uh, the thing that was not mentioned in his presentation was buffering against the residential zone, I think, uh, the requirements in our regulations call for buffers of a type D or C, depending on how you look at this buffer, and I don't see that addressed yet, but maybe it can be addressed as we go along. I don't know if you're intending to yeah. do that or if you're intending to address that uh, issue, the issue of a but of a uh, the abutting property being residential to the north. Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, of that specific buffer that's listed for the uses. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I believe we meet that here. We didn't get a comment back from staff, um, so I can I can double check to make sure uh, we have the specific number of plantings per well, per foot. Um, I'd like to hear a little more about that. If uh, I think Tim's so looking it up now to kind of provide okay. us with a little bit yeah. more feedback. So you've got an industrial use, which you've got a variance that allows you to do on this property. Um, and the normal buffering between industrial and residential is like Nelson mentioned. It's, it's category D. You can do type one, which is not less than 20 feet wide, earthen berm, not less than four feet in height, deciduous or ornamental shade trees, one deciduous ornamental or shade tree, two evergreens and four shrubs per 20 or linear feet. Uh, type 2 is 30 feet wide, containing a stockade fence or chain link fence, and not less than one distribual, and then the plantings. Type 3, 50 feet wide, with a blend of plantings of pre-existing and uh, new vegetation. And type 4 of 100 feet wide, which obviously we're not talking about here. Yeah. So, so Which is being provided here, I guess, I would ask. And, and how does it... Tom, what are your thoughts on, on the requirement and, and in what way do you view that you've met it or might be able to meet it with some things? It seems to me that your bus parking lot has pretty clearly got, you know, a big, wide, uh, undisturbed forested area. Um, but everything from the back of the existing building where you're going to do your garages back down William Street is essentially the industrial use. Um, and so at your parking lot entrances and all of that stuff, you'd be talking about a need for one of those types of buffers. 
Yeah, we were looking at, at representing, a, you know, a land, more of a landscape buffer there in terms of certainly we don't have an earthen berm um, because we've got a drainage situation out there where we've got to be low there along the property line to capture drainage. Um, if needed, we could install a stockade fence in those areas you mentioned, and it sounds like we would meet the, the regulation being 30 feet with a stockade fence. Um, how wide is that little bit in the second parking lot, the one in the middle of the property? How wide is that landscaped bit there? Yes. That's going to be about 30 feet. Okay. Um, if that's 30 feet, then you'd have to have the stockade fence inside it as well to be a, to meet a 30-foot buffer, correct? Unless you granted a waiver, yes. Unless we granted a waiver. Um, but you've still got essentially the widths of both of your driveways where there's nothing buffering. One, one of the things I think the board should consider as part of this is if you look at the existing condition of that section of William Street where it is basically pavement from start to finish and the dilapidated building, the, the improvement that is being made from a landscaping perspective might justify the not, not the, inc the inclusion or non-inclusion of the fence and some modification of how that buffer is applied. But I, I do believe from a landscape design perspective, this is a significant improvement over what's there today. Dead right. That I agree with. I drove by there yesterday um, and took a look. Mm -hmm. And you're right. It's not only a sea of pavement, but there's an old boat lit sitting over there and a broken down trailer and who knows what else is over there. Um, it, it's a mess today. Um, but it also doesn't have anything moving back and forth, like 37 buses. It doesn't have our approval either. Yeah, that's true, too. And, and I would certainly note at this stage that, at least from my staff's perspective, is we're not recommending that any final action be taken on this application tonight. That is, we allowed the peer review and the Highway Safety Committee to get their comments in and for us to review um, those comments and make any additions to our memo as, as necessary moving forward. As I think at this stage, the understanding was that given where we sit with peer review and the sensitivity of this and the fact that the variance was involved and this is not a typically a permitted use in this area, that this was going to be a project that took multiple meetings with the planning board. I agree. And I'm also eager to hear the results of the Highway Safety Committee. Nelson? Uh, <clears throat> so, well, I'll hold the others till, or, or, or if you want to go through all of these. The, um, it's up to you. The, the, other, other questions the things other questions or things uh, the wetlands in the back is there a buffer there I don't uh, I, uh, I see it called out as a stormwater management area it looks like the parking comes right up against it um, the wetlands is okay you got it the wetlands right. located back, I see. back here and I we've see. got the 25 foot buffer I see Okay. Um, let me see. The uh, I use the parking the fuel. The fueling station you say is getting getting a professional review from DES or D so yes, DES uh, regulates we review all fuel islands and above ground storage tanks. So that's that that's one of the required state permits for this project. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Where does the drainage go from this site in its redesigned configuration? What's what are the outfalls of drainage? Is it all on site uh, infiltrated, or is there some? Yep, there's there's uh, six different rain gardens that are located within the easterly developed portion of the site, mm -hmm. and a, a couple of those are tied together along the easterly and southerly uh, part of the property. And there's a swale just south of the bus lot that then kicks into the basin in the back that if and ever that overflowed, it would kick into the wetland. There's also a, a two rain gardens located along William Street that are connected there as well. They're connected. These rain gardens are all interconnected. Correct. And they all eventually empty into the, the wetland in the back. Yes. Well, if and they overflow. Whatever doesn't infiltrate or overflows. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Our calculations were shown in a 50-year storm event that nothing was getting off the site. Okay, so you're good up to 50 years. Yes, is what yeah. you're saying. There's also the rain gardens. Uh, there's a little dished out area, and there's a leaching catch basin that sits up above it, about mm -hmm. six to nine inches. And if water ever kicks into that, there's infiltration trenches that are connecting some of them. Okay, I didn't notice those on the plan, but uh, okay. Um, the building, the current uses of what we call the summit building, the building up in front, they're remaining in there. 
the uh, that's the intent. Yes, that's the intent, and the parking has been allocated accordingly to those, and um, the. Uh, uh, I think that does it except for the, I had some questions on the uh, traffic uh, study. And I don't know if we're going to okay. Yes, I have that. some questions on traffic as well, yes. but I wanted to mention, since you mentioned parking, just to call attention to the fact that the applicant has represented that he's a few spaces short and he's got a couple of areas where he's designated as potential future parking if it turns out that he needs those last, I don't know, 10 or 12, whatever they are. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure nobody overlooked that. Yeah, five of those are in that buffer area we were just discussing mm. next to that back parking lot. Yeah. In the, yes, it's in the, I see what he's saying there. Future the five, the five there, yeah. In that so he would have, yeah. Yeah, that's true. If you, um, if you were to count that area as being your buffer, then that can't be your extra spaces. spaces you, can't, you have to figure out have to put them where else or, or, or approach us to discuss whether it's appropriate to waive those last five or six requirements and make a case for that, um, which I would think looking at the number of spaces on the site and all of the things you've talked about would be a not impossible yeah. standard to convince <laughs> us of. <laughs> um, I have questions about the the traffic study, and I looked at it. I had it scanned in by the staff and sent to me. I didn't bring a copy here that I can kind of point to what were the issues that raised my concern. Um, I think as the traffic comes and goes, I get the idea that the buses are going to come at a little bit uh, shifted time. The morning time is more of a concern than the afternoon or evening. Um, in the morning, sometime between 6 and 7, you're going to have all the buses file out onto William Street and then try to turn into the traffic on Daniel Webster Highway. Um, and I think that the right turn will be somewhat difficult and the left turn will be very awesome. difficult, <laughs> more so at that time. Um, as I read through the report, I was seeing some mention that the study of that intersection said that at various times 20 or 30 seconds of a wait time per vehicle um, to make that turn from William Street on a DW highway, which seems fine if you're talking about a stray car or two, but if you're going to file out 37 buses at once and each one of them is going to have a, a third to a half of a minute to find its space, and I think that's probably a little bit of a conservative estimate. I think that when you hit some traffic, it may be tougher than that. You could be talking about 15 to 20 minutes to file out that line of buses to get out of there. And I think that's probably why the police officers thought we don't want this to be developed and then uh, the, the obligation be put on them to say, well, we need, suddenly need a police officer to come stand at this corner and direct traffic, which is what happens near the high school when virtually a half the size of the number of buses try to get in and out at one time. Um, and so I wanted to hear some comments and some uh, a, a better understanding of how this traffic in the morning will leave at maybe not exactly the same time, but close to the same time, and filter off of William Street onto DW Highway. Mr. Chairman, could I just, as a course, school bus driver, toss my oar in? The only time that 36 buses are going to come out of William Street is the 1.30, 1.45 time, because that is when they go as a sort of convoy up to the middle school to pick to start the afternoon dismissal. I would point out, and I think it's relevant, and I hope the traffic committee is going to remember this, that up to five years ago, before five years ago, while well, they've been on the site and Star Drive, we had the same number of buses stuck down Railroad Avenue. We had to get those buses out in exactly the same method, frankly in a more difficult part of the town, and it was the, the town centre, not a bit further out of the town. And I, I, when I read the brief chief's comments, I nearly fell off my bed laughing for two reasons. One, he never seemed to worry about it when we didn't, when the Laid Lauren, first June we operated out of Railroad Ave. And secondly, we also have a discussion which I think we will all remember about a development up by the middle school where the police chief decided that 36 buses 
plus probably 50 to 55 parents picking up little Willie or little Jane, coming out at the same time did not create a need for any traffic control whatsoever. And you will also recall that I also fell off my chair when I, we discussed that one. I think the police chief, I understand his wishes and I obviously don't wish to inconvenience, but I do honestly urge you all to recognize that the only time there is a big group of buses is at the 1.30 time. The stuff going out at between six and seven drifts out because the buses start at different times. The coming back is exactly the same reason, remembering we're at the school system requires only four buses to unload at a time at the school. That's breaking up the flow. And the same applies in the afternoon. So well, returning to the site's easy, how is it that they don't all leave at one time in the morning? They don't because they've got different times. Because elementary, middle school, and high school well, have different the, start the, times. You, well, it also depends where you're going. I mean, some people, there's going to be buses who'll have to leave sooner because they're going to have to get down the south end of town to pick up the students there. The buses, on the other hand, going into London Court and picking up down a DW Highway are going to go later. It, they don't all go out together. The only time, and I'm, I'm not trying to support well, anybody, I'm just making a simple statement from my experience. The only time you're getting 36 buses going out is at about 1.30 to 1.45. Now, I personally am hoping we can lean on the applicants so that we don't send 36 buses out at once, like we currently do, like we always have done. I'm hoping that he will agree to break that up because I think that 36 buses is a problem. But all the other times of the day, the buses are going in and out of William Street, and I hope the traffic engineer will agree with me, don't have that problem. Where the buses are broken up because of location of students for picking up and unloading of students and leaving the school because the school break it up, they will not allow more than four buses to unload at a time. I just make that point. Thank I you. just think you should all remember it. And I hope this I disagree. The police chief hears it as well. <laughs> I want to disagree just based on my own observations of what goes on at Star Drive, that there's, they come out of there in large numbers, maybe not 35, maybe 25, a large number, continuous driving out one after the other like bees out of the hive. At what and, time? And, well, in the morning. I don't doesn't matter what time. Whatever time it is, that's the time that they're, they're, that they're coming out. And that's what should go into the traffic plan. And so they do come out in groups. And, and I've seen it. So I disagree with you. You've been analysis. there at 615 and watched him come out, Nelson. He's a YMCA member. He goes all the time. I, Steve, let us have it. I leave the thought. Yeah. <laughs> Please introduce you yourself, even though we know you, All right. and then let us know what we need to hear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, for the record, uh, my name is Stephen Pernall with Pernall and & Company, and tonight we're representing Student Transportation, Inc. It's green. Try green to a little closer. Again. I can, it's on. I can hear it when you moved it, but it's very closer to your yeah, That's good. All right. I'll start over and say you that uh, this is Stephen Pernall with Pernall & Company. Uh, we prepared the traffic evaluation for Student Transportation, Inc. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I did bring along my flip chart, so I never leave home without it. <clears throat> if you want, I can take 10 minutes and kind of go through the whole study, or I can attempt to answer questions as you deem fit. This is I'd rather have you focus on the questions than go through the whole thing, because I don't know if other members agree, but I, I think that as the buses are arriving off of DW Highway to turn onto William Street, um, there's some concerns about that for me, but not nearly as much as the impact of trying to get all those buses out onto DW Highway in the first place. All right. Well, um, just to talk uh, a little bit about the first issue, and that's left turn arrivals um, from Route 3 onto William Street. We did analyze that uh, specifically as part of our, our traffic study. <clears throat> and on page 17, you'll find that we did a, a left turn lane warrants analysis. And we don't have the traffic study individually, right? I mean, uh, it wasn't in the packet. Um, Tim, do you have one with you? I have one with me, yes. Well, I, we're going to have to get them distributed, but we're not doing final action tonight anyway. Well, I, I know, but you told him not to go through the review, and now he's starting to review specific pages, and uh, it just seems a little frustrating to me, but that's, I'm mm -hmm. just one person. 
Fair enough. Um, let me correct that. Since I'm the only one that's had a chance to dig into your review a little bit, um, please uh, offer a more full presentation of all of the details of it rather than focusing on my question. All right. Uh, I can, apologize. Can I take this to the... Uh, you can take that. <laughs> take that. Now we're on. Now you're on. All right. Uh, let me walk you through the study, if I can, in, in 10 minutes or less. <clears throat> uh, figure one simply just shows the study area. You folks know where it is. Uh, the blue dots show where we conducted our intersection counts. So we went out on a typical weekday from 7 to 9 in the morning, two-hour period. And then we went back in the afternoon from 3 to 6, a three-hour period. And the reason why we do these five hours of data collection is so we can calculate when the peak one hour period is uh, in the morning and in the evening. Uh, Steve, can you hold the microphone a little higher? I can. There you go. Uh, what's not shown on this diagram uh, is the fact that we went down to Star Drive exactly for that reason. We wanted to, in addition to taking the numbers that our client provided us with, we wanted to go down there and get some factual information. And I think to answer uh, Nelson's question, I'll refer to that a little bit later. But you know the study area. We always start our studies by looking at what available traffic data might be out there and available. This data was not used elsewhere in the study, but we did found a DOT count about a mile to the north on Route 3. So can't use the numbers, but we actually presented this so you can kind of see what the trends are. So the top graph is showing Sunday through Saturday, and again, no surprise, but weekday volumes are your busy times out here. If you take these weekday volumes and you plot it from midnight to midnight, you'll notice that consistently there's a peak in the morning, drops off, peak in the afternoon, and drops off. These lower two are the Saturday and Sunday volumes. But again, very consistent. Uh, <clears throat> but again, because this is a mile away, you really can't use the data. But we use this trending information to come up with that 7 to 9 and 3 to 6 count period. So, this is the same thing. Figure 2 in the report shows the results of the morning peak hour count and the afternoon peak hour count below. So the morning at the site, the highest traffic hour was 7.15 to 8.15. In the evening, 5 to 6 p.m. In terms of volumes on Route 3, uh, 978 north of the study area. In the afternoon or evening peak, 1,252. Again, pretty typical to see the p.m. higher than the a.m. William Street, only four cars in the morning, in and out, six in and out in the evening. The second area, Southerly Site Driveway, only accommodated three cars during both periods. And you can look at the turning movement patterns, but with numbers that are single digit, you really can't draw too much in terms of conclusions. But that's your existing condition. As with all studies, we do some factoring to come up with a, yes, sir. You said that you went out on a typical day to make those counts. Did you go on one day or did you go on yeah. multiple days? Inter or? Intersection counts are typically done on, on a typical weekday. So okay, we the DW Highway, if, especially if there's trouble on the Everett Turnpike, yeah. is dramatically different from day to day. And I don't know if you see any excursions or any extraneous information. You know, what, what, what was your typical day? I mean, if it was a day that the, that the Everett yeah. Turnpike was messed up, well, DW we're, Highway would be terrible. We're certainly uh, unaware of any particular incident like that, but when we look at the volumes that we see, again, 978 versus 1252, um, that's consistent with our expectations. Then your date um, on there is March 20... 29. 29th. It's a Wednesday. Of this year? Correct. Okay. The other thing that we intentionally do not do is count on a Monday or a Friday. Those are, can be atypical. So this is kind of right down the middle. We then did uh, future projections for an opening year of 2018. 
And this is basically done by taking the raw data and factoring it up to a peak month condition. The uh, peak month factors were 12% for the morning count and 10% for the evening. So no matter what month we count, we always factor up. So these volumes are bumped up for that reason. Now on the left side of figure 3A, you're looking at the morning peak hour and the evening peak hour. The right hand side, we, we uh, added a couple of cases. And we're calling this uh, an arrival peak hour from 8 to 9, and then an arrival peak hour in the afternoon as well. So again, we just we analyzed some additional cases as part of the study. Figure 3B, same deal, but this is 2028. So we're going into a 10-year planning horizon, again, factored up by a background growth rate. And that's how we came up with these no-build numbers. Table 1 in the study is uh, what Tom was reading from earlier, where we identified trip generation. And uh, he told you 320 trips on an average weekday. Half of them coming in, the other half leave. And we broke it down by buses. But don't forget, for every bus that leaves, there had to be a driver driving to the site. And at the end of the day or at the end of the shift, when the bus comes in, the driver gets in his car and leaves. So you've got that as well. And then there's some miscellaneous uh, trips from on-site staff as well. But there's your total. We tried to give you the breakdown for all those different hours and the numbers in a box are the ones that we uh, forwarded to, to our analysis in terms of capacity. Can you tell us what those numbers are because there's no way we're reading okay. that chart from here. Sure. So during the morning street peak hour, that's 7.15 to 8.15, we're expecting this facility to generate only 10 trips, five in, five out. Reason being the drivers are leaving much earlier after 6 a.m. So the bus drivers come in in their cars, 37 of them, and then they leave within that hour. So that volume is 77. So the buses are already gone when the normal rush hour hits. Exactly. Then the buses come back. The highest hour for bus arrivals in the morning is 8 to 9. Next thing that happens in the afternoon, we have the departure peak hour of buses. So the drivers drive in in their cars, get in the buses, and leave. Uh, that happens, the peak hour is 145 to 245. <clears throat> Next event, buses come back. It's peak hour, it's 315 to 415. Now they're all back home, drivers have left. Now you have the street peak hour, evening, 5 to 6 p.m. So you can see how uh, there's a drop off. Uh, again, single digit trips during the street peak hour. When the buses are coming in, we have 72 total trips. And then here we have a few trips off peak hours. Again, we pick that up from, from uh, our observations down at Star Drive. And, uh, and then there's your weekday total. The other thing that I didn't mention, it's minor, but I, I will mention the no build projections that account for some vacancies in that existing building. We learned that not all tenants are, not all the space is rented, so we did include that as well. So now that we have the quantities of future trips, we can then do our future projections for 2018 uh, for the four peak hours and then for 2028. And again, these are called build projections. Uh, in this case, we really didn't have to work too hard to figure out trip distribution, where they're going and where they're coming from, because our client has a route plan. They know where the schools are, they know where they're heading. Uh, <clears throat> but just to summarize, um, during that departure peak hour, say in the afternoon, they're all going to be right turn departures heading to the three schools. That's a good thing. Right turn departures are easier than left turn departures. Now listen to what I said. That was during the school bus departure peak hour in the afternoon. When buses come back, they come from both directions depending on where their last route was. But uh, trip distribution is really a function of the, of the bus system. But now that's the afternoon, but in the morning, the buses could go left or right. Exactly, when they're leaving okay. and when they come back from both directions. And you'll find in the report um, that breakdown. Okay. 
This particular they, figure is our, our standard. Excuse me, when they're, when they're coming back in the morning, they're coming from the schools, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So they're so not going to be coming back both directions, are they? Probably. Correct. I mean, they're you said all they were be, all going right, right to go to the schools. I think I, I misspoke because I was talking two different peak hours, but you're right. Okay. So in the morning, they're going to be coming north on DW Highway and left turn into the site. Well, that's not quite true. I mean, yeah. right. you've, got three, it, it you've got three ferry school. They, they'll be coming in from a different direction. Yeah, and why won't, wouldn't there be some left turns going out in the morning? Oh, they will. For the same reason. Well, yeah, they're left they and went. right in the going out in the morning. Yeah, no, he's talking about in the afternoon. In the afternoon, they're all right. Well, the well left ferry school. They're going out to the middle school. There's a block to pick them up. The way the uh, system school is first. Yes. They don't go to Reed's Ferry first when they leave the bus terminal. They go to the middle school first. They all go to the middle school. But in the morning? In the morning, in the morning they, they go, go in all directions. Okay. Because no, yeah. there's a bunch of them up at Bishop Field or whatever that field is up by the middle school. Yeah, but that's where they, they have already done the middle school and the high school, and they are sitting there ready to start the baby run for the, the lower schools. They sit there up and rather than go back to the terminal, I'm just telling you what happens. I'm no, guys, no, understood. I, thanks for the information. I was trying to figure out. Yeah, but you please you, proceed. Okay, uh, figure five is is always in our report. It's called an impact summary, and all we're doing here is comparing the no build with the build numbers, so you can look up and see what's the percent impact, percent increase, and also the magnitude. And again, not to confuse things, but we have those four different hourly cases that we analyzed. Bottom line conclusion, during the morning street peak hour and the evening street peak hour, the net impact on Route 3 is less than 1%. During the arrival peak hour periods for bus traffic, which is off peak times, the percent increase ranges from 2 to 4%. Again, more buses and volumes are lower on Route 3. So math mathematically, the percents are as high as 4%. The important number to me, though, as a traffic engineer, is I'm looking at the magnitude. Plus 28, plus 29, plus 43, plus 41. Steve, does your analysis take into account that buses aren't like cars? I mean, they're bigger and slower and bulkier and wider turning, and everybody stops when they stop and all of that? That, that does get reflected in the next table I'm going to show you. Thanks. So again, impact summary, 2 to 4% during the off-peak periods, during the street periods, uh, less than 1%. Now these tables look at intersection capacity and level of service. So I'm going to tell you what the tables say, and then I'm going to tell you what I think. Two different things. <clears throat> Top one is the William Street intersection. This is the Southerly Site driveway. And here we're looking at the, um, the two arrival peak hour periods because that's when things are going to be the busiest. And what you'll notice in terms of level of service, depending on the, the uh, time of day, it's the intersection and the movement will operate either at A, uh, B, C, or D. So level of service D or higher. The other thing that this table says is stacking, left turn stacking. For instance, northbound left turns less than a vehicle. William Street uh, departures during those particular periods, less than a vehicle. That's what the software says. That's what I have to present in the table. In real life, you're going to see queues of two. There's nothing that says you can't have two buses, one right behind the other, <clears throat> that pull up to a stop bar. So my engineering judgment says queues of two, maybe three, <clears throat> would be your maximum. And if you did have a situation where that third vehicle comes up behind the other two, the first one's gone. So for instance, the, uh, I told you about the uh, when buses leave, it's not on the table, but that departure peak hour, most of taking a right turnout involves uh, a lot less delay than, than a left turnout. And the southerly site driveway, same results, A to D, everything operates below capacity Software says short queues or queues up to one, Pernod saying two, maybe three is a max. 
<coughs> so uh, at, at the top one is William Street. William. And it's the when the buses are leaving the site or coming back? Oh, these are the arrival two hours when the impact on Route 3 is the highest. This is that 4%. This is what we wanted to analyze. Okay. So when the buses are returning to the site, that arrival time that you're looking at is 8 to 9 a.m., correct? That's one of them. Okay. There's also an afternoon one. I, I drive through that area from 8 to 9 a.m. five days a week. And when somebody wants to make a left turn, cars to get to the daycares and the various things that are along the way, I can tell you the queue is not one. It ain't two. It's like 11 and I got a pickup truck and I can drive around them onto the side of the road. But a lot of people don't. And it's really difficult when someone wants to turn in to go to the bagel shop that's over there, you know, all the things that are up and down that side of the road. It isn't one or two today. Well, I think we'd have to, or what I'd like to do is compare the volume at the site you're talking about with the volumes that we have here. Uh, and I think, you know, that might be the difference. The, the other thing that I'm, I do want to address that a little bit later in my presentation with the star drive uh, information. Uh, but let me try to finish this up. Okay. So that's our capacity and level of service analysis. We then, again, we look, we typically do this, but we look at uh, is there a need for auxiliary turn lanes? Do you need a left turn lane out on Route 3? That gets answered here. Do you need a right turn lane on Route 3 for southbound right turns into William? The answer is here. And this table talks about exit lanes from a minor approach. Does it need one, two, or multiple exit lanes? So the answer is no left turn treatment needed. Right turn lane, not needed. The th southbound right turns can occur from the through lane as the left turn, northbound left turns can occur from the through lane. And in terms of exiting cars, the volumes are so low that, that one lane is, is sufficient. So on the top one, the left turn lane analysis, um, what's your limiting volume and what's the volume we're projecting? Because those were close when I looked at them before, I thought. I this is, analysis is 2028, so it's 10 years into the future. Uh, limited advancing volume, and again, I can explain it for anyone who's interested, but 776, and in the year 2028, we'll look at 756. So you're only 10 cars away from hitting your limiting volume? In, in 10 years into the future. What is it on the uh, left side? And that's, but you've picked average days. You get one little hiccup on the highway and right. you've got but, 850 but, and buses lined but up for you days. Also, you, traffic engineers do not design for the highest day of the year. Basic civil engineering, highway design, you use the 50th highest hour or the 30th highest hour. So this is, this is pretty typical. The other thing that I'm gonna tell you about this chart, and I know it's source, very, very easy to satisfy. We get a lot of, I'll almost call it false positives. Uh, we ran an analysis in the last month. I had a site with 10 left turns and it told me I needed a left turn lane. Now I gotta tell you, if, if that's what the engineering is telling me, why do you even have the software just put in a left turn lane everywhere? So I'm using conservative analysis and it's telling me no, you don't have to, to do that special treatment. The other thing you have to keep in mind, and I don't know, maybe, maybe now is when we should talk about it. <clears throat> yeah. Well, also, um, don't forget to talk about, you mentioned that you were going to, but I don't think that you did yet. These left turns are gonna be by buses, which are 42 feet long, they're not cars, and they're slow and they need, according to my partner here, 200 feet of open roadway to get through. Um, that's not yeah. what I need with my, uh, automobile or, or my pickup truck. Yeah. Right. Um, and so is that this analysis that talks about limiting volume and how long it'll take a bus to turn left, is it counting a bus or is it counting a car? It's, uh, it's actually uh, on how long it takes to turn left. That's the previous tables, the capacity in LOS, and it's handled as a truck. It's considered a, as a truck versus a car. Okay. So that analysis does take that into consideration. Thank you. The, the other thing that's important for you to understand we're looking at this bus arrival time. I'm going to read to you the arrival times at Star Drive in the afternoon. Now at that location, well, let me just start at 3.15 to 3.30. So here's a 15 minute period 
11 buses arrive back at that depot. I'm going to read you the, the seconds between buses. And this will sound boring. I'll only do a few. 240 seconds. The next bus, 119. 26, 85, 37, 95, 11. So they don't all come back as one bunch. That they're spread out. The next interval, 3.30 to 3.45, 10 came back that day. Same thing. We've got minutes between buses. What about in the morning time? The afternoon time concerns me less because 3 o'clock, I really believe, is quite a distance from the rush hour. But the right. let me, let 8 me, to 9 is a lot closer to rush me, hour. Uh, so here is a.m. arrival time. The busiest period down at Star Drive was 8.15 to 8.30. 15 minutes, 21 buses came in. Here are some of the headways between buses. 29, 4, 95, 15, 73, 6, 8, 5 as a group. Then 62, over a minute. I can keep going. 28, 9, 6, 11. There's quite a few short times in there. You had and, and again, fives and fifteens are, and this things. is why I told you there's nothing that says you can't have one bus right behind the other taking a left or a right into a site. And that's why I told you a queue of two, maybe three is a maximum. But again, 21 arrivals over a 15 minute period. They're spread out. No, now, a little you're, not, bit. you're not asking me the tough A little question. bit. You're not asking me the tough question, and I'm gonna give it to you. Departures during the PM. And Mr. Mullen, you already talked about it. In the afternoon, they do go out as a big group. Uh, 37 buses got out between 1.45 and 2 p.m. Here are some of the headways. 30 seconds, 16 seconds, 48, 13, 30, 20, 9, 17, 9, and the list goes on. So we talk about, yes, you know, platoons, but there are still gaps between them. And the reason why this is important is that this analysis pertains to that one 15-minute period, if you will, in the day. You don't design for that. If this happened every hour of the day, that'd be a different story. I would agree with you. Gee, that's close. In 10 years, you may need a left turn block. Well, the 1.30 and the, and the 3 p.m., again, are not where the other residents in town are trying to use the road. But that morning time, which, you know, I, I get that the peak is 7.15 to 8.15, and then you're going to follow immediately on that 8.15 to 8.30 with where your traffic comes in. Um, but it doesn't take a whole lot to snarl traffic at that time in the morning when everybody's out there. Um, you know, you get two buses that come 10 seconds apart, and the front one has to wait 30 seconds. By the time the front one makes the turn, you got four buses in the row with those exact times you just read out. And I'm not expecting a 30-second delay because a northbound left turn arrival has only one competing flow, one conflicting flow, and that's southbound through. Right. And yeah. southbound through in the morning is horrific. It's a steady line. It's, it's, a steady line. it's well, horrific we, on that road. <laughs> I'm basing my analysis on data at the site on a typical weekday. And, and I know Merrimack, I mean, not as well as you people, but it also depends where you are on Route 3 in Merrimack. The, this data and this analysis is based on the William Street count. I, I think that Tom's point that day-to-day uh, -day differences are huge. I mean, and it may be that there's something going on on the turnpike. It may be that it rained today or it snowed today or whatever the issue is. But there are some days where that traffic is bumper to bumper for a long stretch from Babusik Lake Road, far as you oh, want. Oh, and I'm oh, driving yeah. in the other direction, so I'm just sitting and I'm waving at all the people that I know in the line. But it goes to Bedford Road. I mean, it's... It's thick traffic. I, I will certainly agree that from day to day, traffic varies. It's a random event, and every day is going to be different. Every day would be different numbers. The conclusions would most likely be the same. Allow me to just to finish up with a um, couple of recommendations we made in the study. One uh, is to maintain the use of stop sign control on the William Street approach. I did see the police department asking about a traffic signal. There is no way you have enough traffic coming out of William Street to meet the manual on uniform traffic control devices for a signal. It's, 
It's not even close. So we're recommending keeping the stop sign. The other thing that we recommended, I don't have the plan, but the turning radiuses on William Street are too tight today to accommodate a bus arrival and a bus departure at the same time. And because that's a likely event, you can have a bus waiting to turn left and somebody wants to take a ride in with another bus, you have to flare William Street out, increase the radiuses, and then taper back to that new width I heard tonight, 24 feet. So those were the two recommendations that came out of the study that way. And now I'll you repeat all that? You, you expect you have a, a, site a bus to leave and a bus to come in at the same time? You design for that. I know, but do you expect that? Sure, it can happen. Well, I'm the, but they never do that. I mean, it, it's possible that that could happen. Right, you could, you could have, a, well, I have to be careful here, but why couldn't you have a southbound right turn arrival coming back early and a late bus waiting to exit? I mean, that, that would be so rare. It would, if you're not going to take into account the traffic changes on DW Highway because of ever turnpike blockages, why would you worry about one or two a month? I, I, uh, I worry about it because I put my stamp on the report. I, I appreciate that, and I, I maybe I'm being facetious, I analyze, but, right, I analyze the but I think there's paths. a lot more traffic variation in, in the traffic on DW Highway than you're implying, and you're saying, well, but maybe it's not a problem. Well, maybe it is a problem, and so I'm, I'm concerned that you're worried about that one issue but not the other. Well. All I can tell you is we looked at the geometry of this intersection. Well, I, I said, have no problem with saying that the geometry should widen, change. Widen I, it I agree. Up. Yeah. And I don't disagree with your uh, assessment of the need for a traffic light. I think that they, you know, would end up blocking more traffic as it cycled through its system 24 hours a day as opposed <laughs> to the 20 minutes that you actually needed it to do something. But. Um, I think that of all of the things that are going on with this project, and we're, you know, we'll probably dig into some more of this, we'll have some peer review of the traffic study, but the traffic is the big concern. And I suspect in a few minutes when we open it up and hear some opinion from any of the neighbors, that that's going to be their biggest concern as well. Um, I also have concern about you know, the questions about washing buses or floor drains or oil collectors and um, snow removal and some of the environmental impacts that come from just having a bunch of trucks around. And I know that they're going to be maintained as well as you can, but there's just always that stuff that goes on with parking lots. But the traffic thing is, I think, the real thing that's going to um, make everyone aware that the site's there. I think visibly, you've got the buses hidden in the back with a lot of screening, and except for the folks on William Street, I doubt anybody else would know that you're even there. Um, and so that's a really good thing, but um, getting them out of there is the hard part and I'm not I want to know more and I want to hear more um, from the neighbors and I have some real concerns about that two quick points um, I understand your next planning board meeting in a couple of weeks I'm not going to be av available at night so I'm hoping I can answer all your questions tonight and I heard something about a highway safety committee meeting I'd be more than happy to attend that and try to share some of the information that I have with those committee sure. members. I don't know when that Highway Safety Committee meets. Tim may know or he may be able to let you know. Um, I think you're on it, right, Tim? Yes, I am. That meeting is, I believe, Wednesday the 10th at 1 p.m. at the police station. Police station, 1 p.m. So uh, if you're not going to be here on the, I, so when we come together on the 16th i would not expect nor recommend that this be continued only two weeks i would no. recommend at yes. least yeah. June I, I was going to get to the same thing but i i want you to be here for the next because when we're going to have feedback from the highway safety committee and then we're going to have our own peer review of your traffic study um, that information is going to be given to us and we'll have questions about it that i suspect you'll have something to say about so whenever at whatever point we decide to uh, take this up again. I want to make sure that it's an appointment that you're here at because mm -hmm. I don't think that we'll get done what we need to get done without having your availability to have those questions answered. Do we have a date for that next one? 
Um, it's the June the either June 6th or June 20th yeah. would be the two meetings in June. First and third Tuesdays of the month, unless there's a holiday in the neighborhood. June 6th is a, a yes, and the 20th is a no. Okay. So I'm going to put in. So when we get to that point, we'll sort of kind of think through what we want to accomplish between now and whenever we meet again, and that'll kind of dictate whether we think June 6th is a good date or some other, other time that we've got to figure out. Um, obviously, we want to be mindful that we're trying to get you through the process one way or the other. I just wanted to mention that uh, obviously we have to go through a thorough review, and, and, and that's the first uh, that's most important. Uh, I just would like to state that uh, student transportation, if they're lucky to get approved, would like to have this facility up and going for this fall. So. Uh, in terms of timing of meetings and, and, and getting pushed back into into late summer, um, that's something that that uh, we'd like to keep uh, on uh, as soon as we can. We'll certainly keep those kinds of things in mind. There's but there's going to be some information that we just need to have in front of us, and um, if schedules sort of dictate, that's the way that it comes out. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious yeah. if if uh, the peer review consultants uh, what their feelings would be on traffic if if. Uh, um, there seems to be a couple different opinions in terms of um, what is actually going on versus what we're representing here and what Steve found in his study. So I uh, certainly um, understand why we want those comments to come in before we reevaluate. And yes. Yes, Steve and I will be at that highway safety meeting. Okay. Sounds and good. just as a point of information, the town's peer review traffic consultant also sits on the highway safety committee as well. He's a local resident as well. Paul Kineska, our traffic <coughs> engineer from CLD, is also a local resident who's part of the Highway Safety Committee. There you go. Okay. Before, before Nelson, you have yeah. a question? Yeah, a couple questions. I, want, I have a couple things I would like our consultant to comment on with regard to our peer review consultant yeah. of this traffic. Uh, first thing was uh, I wondered if the, uh, tr the study that was done for uh, Flatley's development at the north end uh, is a, generated a considerable amount of traffic and I don't know how that compares with he used a 1% the growth rate or something like that background growth and I don't know if this is a bigger number or a lesser number than that but I would like somebody to look at that and tell me whether that's uh, significant or not that's very common in Paul's review to review common known projects that are in the area so I fully expect that that will be part of his review yeah well I want to call it to his attention that one in particular and to Steve's attention as well he he ought to know about it uh, the other thing was yes Steve a question what so on that last pit before you get to your next question uh, that DOT data that you showed that was a mile north do you know specifically where that site is a mile north there's a Hilton Drive there's a okay. counter there yeah you can see it in the room there's a counter yeah that's right I've yeah. never noticed it I just it's a mile. It's past Hilton. Yeah. yeah, so it's in the neighborhood Flatland. of Flatland. Okay. Yeah. That's what I wanted to just get a sense yeah. of where that data was. I'm sorry for yeah. it. Go ahead. No, that's okay. Let's, uh, let's get it clear. Uh, the other thing was there's a 30 mile an hour speed limit assumption here in your analysis. And I wondered if the, the practical matter is that people don't obey the speed limit. They do go faster. And I wonder if that has any effect on this. Um, I'd like our consultant to comment on that. I don't know if it makes a difference, but it's different, that's all. And um, the other thing is uh, I just couldn't uh, get my head around the fact that you were not recommending a right-hand bypass for cars queuing, waiting to make a left turn, uh, going northbound, left turn into William Street. It just... Uh, I can just see a couple of buses stop there and with the traffic coming down and with no way to get around them. Now, Bob That's exactly here, what I was saying, yeah. Yeah, what? That's exactly the point that I was making. That's what you were making, but, but you're brave enough to do things that the, <laughs> the person in front of me doesn't. So. No, sure. so, and you also end up um, yeah. at that at that um, red light by tractor supply and Dunkin Donuts where the when the red light is red the traffic yeah. backs up completely in front of yes of um, 
vault. Now I was going right. to say Xylus. Yeah. Uh, the vault, and and right past this site where you, the there's no gap in traffic and people can't turn left and they can't come out of that little street that's right there. Yes. Um, because they can't get past the stop traffic from the from the light. That's the other so. thing with a, a queue of a fair number of buses. You're going to extend that queue even further and make it make it longer. So, so they're that, trying to turn that's across the southbound it, so. in the morning, especially. Uh, and the two lights, the one at uh, Front Street and another at Babusik Lake Road, which can back up that far. So those are things I would like our consultant to be aware of as issues and, and be able to address for us. And uh, I think that takes care of my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What is the time frame that you're talking about in the morning that you, that you think is the biggest yeah. concern? I'm usually there around 8.15, but that's probably not the peak hour. I think it's probably, I'm probably at the end of it and it's kind of tapering off. You but are. still, you will early. occasionally yeah. see big lines of cars at 8.15, 8.30. Yeah, quarter over 8 o'clock, yeah. I mean, there, there yeah. are days when it's really bad. Heading, yeah. Yeah. heading south. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm heading south. north. Can I just I'm going north, the traffic's south. going south. Can I just point out that at 8.15, they are, have al already dumped the students at the middle school and the high school, and they, the buses are probably, as my friend here points out, they're sitting up waiting to start picking up the little ones. There's not, at 7.15 and 8.15, you are not going to get buses coming. I'm out. not there at 7.15 or 8.15. He said they're going to come back at 8.15 to 8.30. They're going to come back to this site. Because they leave that lot at quarter of eight. Or so yeah. they, they leave the Bishop Field. Yeah, line. they leave Bishop Fields so about quarter to eight because they've got to get the kids Between in school. Between seven thirty and quarter yeah. As one suggestion, can't you just like block out a chunk of the road, paint it, keep this intersection clear for the queuing traffic heading south? Like, don't park in this like from. Yeah, from you Williams can definitely right mark so some that areas that, that say don't don't turning. block it. Um, we have one of those right across the street over work. here where you turn in. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> observes it. Nobody <laughs> observes it. It's there. Yeah. Yeah, it's no. <laughs> and actually, the I don't know. It's not not the bus's fault for there, but if there's a bus trying to turn onto the mm -hmm. road over here, they the bus and one car behind it will block that road off, and I can't get to my yeah, Rotary Club meeting on Thursday yeah. morning. So <laughs> that's how come more that one. Yeah. Um, but Steve, you had looked like you had some response or some more comments to some of this stuff that was discussed, and I don't want you to be cut off and not be able to provide that. Just wanted to say that near microphone. Mike. State count was conducted uh, on Route 3 north of Hilton Drive. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, do members of the boards have more questions about n not just traffic, but any There's other aspects? Ooh, the other aspects. <laughs> I mean, but it's not your only chance, but yeah. Desiree. Yeah. I don't know if it was included and just not in our set, but no architectural plans were provided for the, for the building, so elevations. What's it look like? How fancy? Will it match the other building? It doesn't appear to be big enough that it needs to be broken up. I was looking at that. It's like 50 by 60 feet on your plans. Yeah, I just got these yesterday, so I apologize. When we resubmit, they'll be included in, in, in the plan set. Um, essentially, you've got, uh, you know, a, a vinyl, a white vinyl clapboard siding, um, and so the maintenance addition is going to match that. You can see we're uh, maintaining a pitch roof, which is, a, you know, a, not very common for a maintenance garage, but we, we'd like to, uh, you know, continue the, the architecture of the existing building. Um, there's a couple windows on each side just to kind of break up that facade, but generally just, you know, white vinyl siding. What's the building height? Sorry, I can't see the font on it. <laughs> Neither can you. <laughs> so it's 26 feet. Okay. Um, and what was the base material? Of it, you've got clapboard siding. What is the transition yeah, to? Yeah, I think it's base? just exposed concrete. Exposed concrete. Yeah, yeah. it's essentially an ex, um, exposed foundation wall there. Mike, just a quick um, question for Tim, with regards to the use of the storage of the um, fueling station and the fuel. There's no limitation to that for this uh, aquifer conservation area. Because they got the variance, no. Because of the variance. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Um, let's open it up for the public. Uh, can you gentlemen let them have the table for when they want to come forward, if they do? Any member of the public or butters who wish to weigh in?
get comfortable and settled in and when you sign in, whenever you're ready, no rush. Please begin by introducing yourself and then tell us what you want us to know. <laughs> I love these things. Uh, my name is Carol Flitter. Um, I've lived at 536 Daniel Webster Highway for 50 years. So I kind of know about the traffic too. <laughs> trying to get in and trying to get out. Um, and it's not as easy as he makes it out to be. Um, also, just a, a point with Mr. Milton's um, coming out of Star Drive, they're going in, there's a four lane there in the morning. It's a little easier. This is two lane that they're working with out here in front of us on Route 3. Okay. Just, you know, a fact. Um, my questions, not questions, but my problem is with diesel fumes. Uh, I have a friend who lives on Turkey Hill, and that's the route the buses are taking now. And she said when they go by, every time they go by, her house reeks of diesel fumes because they have to go up a little bit of a hill and they have to accelerate. Um, I, I have asthma and all those buses going by, going by my house, um, what would they say, how many trips they figure, uh, 300 a day or something? 300 additional trips into a, but it's into a traffic stream that has 1,500 cars an hour. So no, I mean going by my house mm -hmm. on William Street Williams. is yeah. what I'm, yeah was what I'm talking about. Yeah. They're going to have to go over the full length of William Street is what it sounds like. It's a, William Street is a dead end street. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they would be entering On from that, their parking lot all the way at the very cul-de-sac. That cul-de-sac down and there. And then driving down and then the coming in. The full length of the, turn of the street. Turn kind of right in front of you, yeah. Okay. Um, Star Drive, they have a lot longer to queue up to come out of. William Street isn't that long. Where are we? I haven't seen the plans, so I don't know what all these lovely things are going to look like <laughs> or are proposed to look like. When we went to the zoning um, meeting, they said something about their contract with the town of Merrimack expires 2020. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. That would be the bus company's contract with the school district. Right. So from our viewpoint, we would look at this as the, what they're proposing for the site would be a permanent addition, um, and that's what it would be approved to be, to be done on this site. And if somebody, you know, if they moved out in 2020 and somebody decided I'm going to, you know, use this as a landscaper's yard or something, they'd have to come before the planning like they board did and on make a proposal. Railroad Avenue. That's exactly what happened on Railroad yeah. Ave, that yeah. site. I didn't choose that because of Railroad Ave, but I'm just trying to think of what else you would use a big old parking lot for. Right, right. Okay. So there's a lot of, lot of expense, a lot of time going into two years possibly with no guarantee that they're going to be there any longer than that. Correct? So, uh, yes, but there's also a secondary answer to that in that the school will always have a contract with somebody. That may or may not choose to use that facility. Mm -hmm. Depends on how well these guys design it to be a great bus facility if it there ends up being approved. So There you go. Um, as opposed to the drainage, right now on William Street there is a... Um, no, he just told me what it's called, and I forgot. It goes catch, underneath. Catch basin or a cul uh, culvert. Culvert that goes right underneath that drains on our land, drains on theirs. So it comes. So every time it rains, we have a little. There's bottle. a culvert near near your home. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, was that something in your plan, Tom? Okay. Point it out when you get back to the microphone, so we know where it is. Um, when and that that, that drains in both directions, depending on what's going on with the uh -huh. rain. Uh huh. And right now, um, it goes mostly our way because the landscaper that's renting over there right now has filled in a lot of that drainage area with okay. stumps and such. So. Okay. So we get the benefit of that. I don't know is that going to continue in their plans? Is that going to continue or not? I would kind of hope not. Uh, we'll find out some more when we get some okay. questions. But I think these next meetings, the next planning project. meeting, do we still get notified of that? So when meetings get continued from one to another, the only notice you get is what we say here at the meeting, where we say we're going to continue it to you know, June 6th or something. And that's the only notification, other than the fact that there will be an agenda published 
and it'll be an agenda item. Okay, because we've been getting um, registered letters up right. until now, but we won't so be getting that after this. You only get that okay. at the initial. Now, if for whatever reason, instead of being continued, they withdraw or propose or change it, then there would be new notice. But you are able to get, and Tim can probably provide you the information, um, the email, the, the agendas for all town meetings, including mm -hmm. ours, mm -hmm. are sent out to anybody that wants them by an email list. Okay. You can get yourself on that list, and then probably two weeks ahead of the meeting, the agenda will come out. You can get and have a look and see what's on it. Okay. All right, just, just to address the traffic, though, like I said, we've lived there for 50 years, and I've sat out on Route 3 any time of the day waiting to get into from coming from um, Merrimack, going north. And I sit there and just pray that nobody rear ends me because of the traffic coming the other way. So when you're going north and you want to turn left into your into William Street to get to your house? Mm -hmm. Invariably, uh, I have to sit there, no matter the time of day. Uh, going out, same thing. Okay. Either way you're going, especially going north, um, you sit there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't have your experience from have having lived there for so long, but <laughs> when I went to visit it yesterday, yeah. um, it was probably it was way, way after the rush hour, it was like six right. thirty or maybe even close to seven. And there wasn't a whole lot of traffic at that time, but of mm -hmm. course that's yeah, and we'd not be, the we're peak going, hour. We're going during the day. I you know, going to work, whatever yeah. when I was working. Um, it just uh, I, I just can't picture two buses going out at a time, just sitting there and, and making it out and not having to sit there and smell those fumes. That's what I'm, one of my major concerns. And maybe the difference in the of worth of my house, I don't know if that will distract from it. I know we're a residence in a commercial zone. Um, we say, sign a waiver every year or whatever that's stating that for taxes, but I just wonder. So the variance the process only. that the zoning board takes up is where they consider whether a proposed use would affect the values of the land around it. Planning board, we look at whether they've met all the conditions and our regulations, <laughs> whether they have the lighting right and okay. the parking lot right and yeah. all of that stuff. I know we're the only house abutting the land, but there are other two residences beside me. On the other side of you? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Between Reed's Ferry Lumber and the Summit Building are three residences. Okay. Just wanted to be aware of that. Thank you. Thank you for the no information. No problem. No problem. Does anybody else wish to provide the board with any information about the proposal? Sure. Nobody else? Okay. Oh, um, thank you for that, Zina. I got the, my note over here and I didn't pay attention to it. Um, the board has received a letter which uh, should be read into the record um, as a part of the public hearing. It is from a Stephen A. Miller, um, who is a, I'll, I'll read the letter. It says, I am a 37-year resident of Merrimack and live in Reed's Ferry. The proposed use of the site for storage and maintenance of school buses has serious problems for the abutting properties and the surrounding area. The traffic caused by a caravan of buses leaving and arriving will cause gridlock on a two-lane road not designed for such use. Waiting behind buses making a left turn will force impatient drivers into the breakdown lane to pass them. People and kids walk in this lane and run the risk of being struck. The old site in South Merrimack has a four-lane highway with a turn lane. Diesel engines require additional time to warm up in the winter. The noise and pollution will permeate the adjacent properties, including London Court across the street. Large-scale truck maintenance garages generate pollutants. We have enough problems with PFOA without adding anything else to our aquifers. The ZBA failed to discuss the diminutive effect on property values before voting three to two to approve the change in use. Lastly, the culture of our community will be radically changed by turning a quiet street into a traffic nightmare, and that's signed Stephen A. Miller, uh, dated today. Um, so that will be part of the record. Um, and again, I was just reading from the letter. It doesn't necessarily mean that I've adopted any of those positions that are described in the letter. Um, with that, if there are no other abutters or citizens who wish to weigh in, we'll close the public hearing with a note that at each of the opportunities where we have a chance to um, consider this application, there will be a public hearing component of it where you can have something to say. With that, let me get you guys to come forward a little bit. I want you to um, give me a little bit better understanding where this culvert is and what its functions are and what its future is, and then um, respond to any bit of the information that the uh, a butter or this letter had offered that you wish to. Yeah. Uh, 
Greg Stinson, Student Transportation of America. Um, in response to the revenue contract uh, with the uh, Merrimack School District, we have uh, four years after this year, so it expires in 2021. In uh, our business, uh, typically contracts don't exceed five years, so we feel like this was a good opportunity timing-wise to address it where it was a significant investment and uh you know from our perspective you know this is probably pretty close to as long of a return that you get in our industry um uh, in response to the uh, diesel fumes i just want to want uh, to note that we utilize uh, uh 2012 uh, clean diesel emission fleet currently uh the intent is is to slowly replace that fleet um, again, with additional clean diesel buses, we have 10 of them on order for this fall. Yeah, it'll be 2018. They're clean diesel, smokeless diesel uh, vehicles. I, I'm not sure, you know, whether it was a competitor's bus, but our vehicles uh, have zero particulate. Um, you know, there's DPF filters on there, which catch that, uh, you know, the black carbon that uh, is typically associated with diesel exhaust. And uh, uh, again, just want to maintain that we're a clean diesel fleet. Thank you for mentioning that. That's important. Tom? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to address uh, the culvert and kind of explain that a little bit. Um, so there's a small, uh, as I mentioned, William Street right now, if you've ever been out there, it's dead flat. It ponds. And, you know, I've been, uh, since we've got this project over the last few months, I've been, every time it rains or a big storm event, I rush out there to see, you know, what happens. And, and like I said, there's a, there's a small leaching catch basin at one of the driveway entrances that we couldn't, our surveyors couldn't find any outlet to. So I'm, I'm assuming it just was put there to relieve uh, localized ponding during small rain events. Um, eventually, w when this kind of area fills up, it does kick in. Uh, the culvert um, that was mentioned is in this location here. It's located on our plans. Uh, in fact, the the uh, Public Works Department asked for an easement from us on our side of the street to, to maintain that in the future. I'm not really sure the story behind it. it. It's essentially dead flat. And I think there's a small drainage area between the highway and the back of the residence where it's in the woods and it moves slowly in this direction. The pipe is pretty dead flat right now. There's a low spot in the woods here. so. Um, yeah, it really just goes into the ground. I went out there in about an inch and a half rain event, and I didn't see any water in it, though I don't uh, dispute that there could be, in a, in a bigger rain event, there could be water there. Uh, the site has deep sandy soils, so if it does pond there, um, you know, temporarily it will go into the ground. Um, I will say that because we are lowering grades specifically right here, that in the proposed condition, if this wooded area ever did fill up with water, it would kick into our stormwater basin and alleviate any ponding upstream. This is this is higher than this, so um, we're, 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 we'd be improving that kind of localized ponding. Um, also, as I mentioned, in the existing site, that sea of pavement drains out onto William Street now, where it just sits there. So we're capturing most of that with these rain gardens along that edge. So uh, I think uh, you know after the project is constructed. Uh, the drainage on William Street will not be perfect. You'd probably still get some localized ponding, um, but it would certainly be less than what you see out there today. Thank you. I want to jump around subjects a little bit to pick up on something you mentioned earlier in passing, and that was that the Conservation Commission had um, considered the project, and I think that you said that they recommended the Green Snow Pro snow treatment. Now, so, Green Snow Pro is not salt-free. Um, did they say green snow pro or did they say no salt? So when we went to the meeting, I had already preemptively, based on previous meetings there, added those notes to our plans based on previous projects. So uh, it essentially talks about the judicious use and that, uh, you know, that they shall use a green snow pro certified uh, winter maintenance contractor. Um, okay. I'm assuming they were okay with that because it wasn't um, identified in their report. Okay. as asking for anything further. I don't remember what I saw in their report. Let me see if I can find it really quickly. More. It may not come from Conservation <clears throat> Commission, given the fact that it's Wellhead. You might see it from MVD rather than Grotcom. Yeah, I would expect MVD to wade in on this. Yeah, there. I would hope they would wade in, so to speak. <laughs> Here it is. Um, 
Similar to Star Drive, commissions concerned about runoff caused by washing buses. The water will be contained soaps, oils, and salts and need to be directed to an appropriate treatment system. Recommends the use of native plantings for all greenscape. Commission recommends that the applicant utilize soil testing facilities to determine level of application of fertilizers. Um, so they don't mention snow or snow pro at all. But it is on the recommendations. Yeah. No, understood. I, yeah. But I didn't know if, so normally we hear from the Conservation Commission that we uh, adopt no salt use on various sites. And I would, uh, it just caught me as curious that they would have said, yeah. I to go green. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, now, in this particular area, you're not very far from the wells, and there's a heavy salt use on DW Highway um, that we wish we could lessen, but it is typical for us, and I think including, you know, Xylas and some of the other ones in the area where we've said no um, chemical de icers, um, sand and plows were, were uh, the appropriate use to keep the salt from running anywhere. Um, I don't know what the rest of the board thinks about that proposal or how that would impact what you've got going on. Um, it probably is the same thing that you got going on in Star Drive. So that's correct. Yeah. Yep. So you've probably figured out how to deal with it. <laughs> so where do you take your buses now to wash them? Uh, it, it's somewhere in the neighborhood. I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with the name of the company, but it was somebody uh, on the southern end of town that has a, a reclaiming system. So I think they go on a pad and it was kind of recycling the the water um, as they wash them. I think we approved that for the mobile station. The facility, the station is, I, I'm, Mr. Chairman, I'm sure it's the mobile station because they've got a pad washing system there. But maybe they go somewhere else. There's another one, too, uh, opposite uh, Columbia Circle. There's a. Uh, yeah, yes, there is. Yeah, that, yes, there is truck washing down there as well. You're yeah. right, Nelson. Yeah. Anyway, just curious. Um, other comments or questions by members of the board? So, what do we need to accomplish between now and our next meeting? We want to get our peer review back which probably won't take very long because they got 10 days and they've had the stuff already. Um, but then the staff needs some time to go through that and digest it a little bit. Um, is that going to include the, the traffic or is that a separate peer review process for traffic? No, peer traffic is included with that peer review. Okay. So we'll have that information from them. Um, that won't take a great amount of time. Uh, what else do we need to accomplish between now well, and the next traffic meeting? committee, Mr. Chairman. Well, and they're going to meet next week, and yeah. I don't know at what point we'd have some um, minutes or some feedback from whatever they determine. You won't see minutes, but you'll see comments from either myself or one of the staff. Okay. Mm, it's just okay. I would like uh, an explanation. Uh, I'd like to know how you're addressing the buffer issue with the residential property uh -huh. and explain yep. that. Um, yeah. Tom. Um, Presumably the bus parking lot is all paved and I guess between that and the maintenance garage and, and stuff I'm concerned about and I haven't heard much about uh, just runoff treatment of uh, oils and diesels and things that come off of the buses and things like that. How are you controlling that runoff and treating it before dumping it into the, wet, the wetlands to the west of you? Yeah, as I mentioned, um, we've got a number of treatment practices located throughout the site. A uh, number of rain gardens and infiltration trenches in the front part of the site and then uh, a large uh, infiltration basin uh, behind uh, the bus parking lot now. And that's so. going to take care of the dirt and grime and oil and everything else that washes off the Correct. buses in the yeah, rain? Correct. Essentially, essentially the, the, the rain gardens and infiltration trench and, and infiltration basin, they're all treatment practices in their own right, but they'll form a treatment train. So. Um, essentially the, the particulates will be removed in the rain garden and then in larger storm events they'll kick into to some of the more downstream systems but uh, all these systems will meet uh, you know DES AOT regulations in terms of uh, qualitative treatment which is essentially relying in the rain gardens there's the the filter media just you know just near the surface that that as the, the water moves vertically it removes the particulates um, and sediment and then similarly in the infiltration uh, practices the natural sandy soils will, will do the same thing we've got requirements to be you know, have a certain separation from seasonal high water so um, we'll need to meet those which in DES's mind is, is we meet qualitative uh, treatment practices. Is there a maintenance program for those fields? There so will be yes. They don't fill up with Correct, yeah. Diesel and oil and stuff yep. like that? Yeah, there's an inspection maintenance or operation and maintenance manual that's required to be submitted as part of that permit, and the, the town will get a copy of that as well, which 
you know, is biannual uh, maintenance, removal of sediment, um, cleaning of catch basin <coughs> sumps, all that good stuff. So, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt you. If you had more to go. Did you, Pardon? Have, did you have more? Or were you all set? Uh, I, not really. I just, I, I had had questions about washing. You talked about not washing and or having to deal with that question in a future time. I think we'll have a better answer for you at the next meeting. Like I said, we weren't aware of the town's policy about uh, no, no floor drains. Um, so um, we've got to come up with a plan there. It'll either be continue to wash off site, um, which is not ideal, or to, you know, to wash inside the, the maintenance addition and uh, continue to be uh, changing out that holding tank. Uh, my guess is washing right. a, a fleet of buses, it's going to be a pretty frequent use and, and, uh, and the emptying of that tank. Right. I think that it would be. So in addition to the um, wastewater treatment plants restriction on connecting your floor drains to sewers, we typically as a planning board don't allow sewer drain or floor drains in maintenance facilities even if you're going to treat it on site or do anything else with it, because that's where the oil is going to go. And so there's, for buildings that had floor drains in them before the maintenance came along, we've had requirements that applicants submit the maintenance plan and the um, design for the oil water separators and how all of that stuff will work. Um, and so however we move forward with this, either no floor drains at all or with floor drains that have protections to keep oil from going anywhere outside of some very confined area will be part of the things that we require and typically that means that there's a maintenance plan that gets submitted to the department as a part of that when there's a, an issue with floor drains or any any drain that's going to collect <coughs> solvents or all of that we've also talked about keeping uh, in the design we, we don't generally get into the interior design of buildings but with um, places that might store solvents or chemicals or other things we do require as a part of our approvals that those things be kept in certain areas that meet all the you know, fire protection and safety and proper storage. As part of the planning board process, not as part of the building permit or anything that comes from the building department. We get an inch deep and they get a foot okay. deep. So They've waded in a little bit more than they should have in the past. <laughs> <laughs> but knowing that it was going to be done. Knowing that, anyway. yes. Building department fire. Yeah. Um, so, what else do we need to accomplish between now and then? I, I tell you that, you know, this isn't the kind of site or project where we would do the uh, planning board site visit or site walk. But I think, as an individual or individual members, I plan to get up early some mornings and watch what happens at Star Drive and watch what happens at this site with the traffic between now and whenever we meet again. I want to go look at it with my own eyes at the time when you're talking about, which is that, you know, your bus is leaving between 6.15 and 7.15 in the morning um, and seeing what's going to go on. I think that you're really going to have a hard time with that traffic. I don't know. I mean, other board members can do whatever they want. Public street, go look at whatever you want to look at. But I want to do that between now and the next time around. Uh, anybody? Paul? With that being said, I think before the next meeting, our own copy of the traffic report would uh, be helpful. So we don't have to pass around it's the same It's available electronically because they emailed it to me. So okay. Thank you for that. I, I had one more thing I wanted to bring up. I wanted to, we didn't get to talk about the landscaping in the front of the building. I was disappointed to see the destruction of the of the flowering trees that are right now in bloom out there uh, to make parking, uh, which to me is a lesser uh, aesthetic <laughs> than than the landscaping that's there. Um, I don't know what you do about that, but uh, I, that's what I have to say about it. <laughs> yeah, we meet, the, we meet the landscape buffer there along Daniel Webster Highway. No doubt we're, we're cutting down a couple trees out there to, to, get, to, to get the parking to meet or get close to code. Um, yeah. We are saving a nice tree just south of the, of the, the driveway. Well, um, thanks for that one, but <laughs> sorry to see that's you. <laughs> consolation. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. It's a fair comment, though. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll there's make one other comment. Yes, please. Um, in your maintenance garage, do you intend to do all of your maintenance interior, internal to the garage, or is there yes. any reason why you would have external lifts that you would be able to lift the buses? You're going to be able to lift the buses inside. Yeah, we use we on. use floor jacks, and there's not not above ground not above ground lifts that lift them up high off the ground, but just floor jacks that you lift up one end to the other. But yeah, all maintenance will be conducted on site. Okay. 
I, I asked because the town has to maintain fire trucks and whatnot and ends up taking them outside of the building to, to do it and I just yeah. didn't know with your buses were going to be a problem as far as being able to lift them but you're only lifting them a short distance that's right no and there's plenty of clearance inside too that 26 feet well that's a roof but there's plenty of room inside to, to lift them up okay thank you Willie. I think that probably would lead to something of a condition of approval that the maintenance that occurs is going to be inside your building and not out in the parking lot or around even if it's minor things that inside the building um, other comments or questions Okay. Uh, I did have one question. Um, yep. Obviously, there's no formal vote or anything tonight, but I uh, was looking for some preliminary feedback from the board regarding the, the, the waiver, specifically the, the sidewalk waiver along William Street. Personally, I wouldn't have any problem with that at all. I'm glad to have the sidewalk along DW Highway, and I wouldn't have a need for one on William Street. I would agree with that, Mr. Chairman. Um, Delighted to have one along, if it links up with these plant thing at um, Vault. Thanks, well, great. Um, so that one was support. Um, did you have other waivers? Door, yeah, it was a door facing, door facing William Street. I wouldn't have any trouble with it either. Okay. either. Um, and as long as the fire department doesn't need a secondary exit or something that leads you to want a door somewhere. And would you be looking for a formal waiver request for the parking? Or um, is that something that? I think um, only if you're going to be reducing the future spaces from what they are shown that would meet requirements. If you're anything on the plan does not meet the requirement then the waiver would come into play okay. so you as long as you've got this future ones that you're showing but not in the buffer um, then you've technically got the spaces that you need either okay. in the initial build or in a follow-up build if you can't show those future spaces then you know ask for a waiver and as I mentioned before you've got an awful lot of parking on this site I can't imagine having a real hiccup over five or eleven spaces or something okay. Um, other things that you need feedback on I think from our discussion June 6th seemed like the best appropriate date that um, May 16th is too soon and June 20th didn't work for mr. Perna is that correct yes. that, that works, works for us okay uh, I'd accept a motion you to want to make a motion we uh, table this matter till June the 6th with no further in at 7 p.m. in this room with no further notice to abut us. I think continue, not table, but other Sorry, than that. continue. I correct, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for correcting me. Paul gets to second the motion to continue. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? We will see you in a month. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you for the presentation and thank you for fielding a lot of questions. I know that we're kind of going in a million directions at once. Um, you did. You really did a good job with your presentation. You deserve Thanks. those compliments. And there's an agenda in here somewhere. I'm going to take my order. Good. Thank you. Fine. Uh, item number nine. I'll take it. Item nine on our agenda. Discussion and possible action regarding other items of concern. I do not have any. Does anyone else have any items of concern that they wish to offer up? Some? No. No? People should be quiet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no items of concern. Uh, item 10 on our agenda is the approval of the minutes of April 18th. What's the will of the board? I approve them as written. Desiree moves to approve the minutes of April 18th as written. Is there a second for that motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Second Chum. by Mike. Oh, no. Good. Mike beat you to it. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? So those minutes are approved. That brings us to item 11, which Mr. is adjourned. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion. We adjourn. Is there a second? <laughs> second by Desiree to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? 700. We are adjourned.